attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. show on yes is brought to you by untuck it shirts designed to be worn untucked shop now at untuckit.com oh boy that jet game was not good that was not well, good usually we come we bump in with a highlight no something. there's no highlight uh, listen, Jet fans can hate me. They think I'm a Jet hater, whatever the case may be. That's not a playoff team. That's a great defense. They made a great quarterback look less than ordinary. They were suffocating, suffocating. The offense can't do it. And I'm not even going to put all of the blame, Don. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to put it all on Zach Wilson. He doesn't have time. He doesn't have weapons other than Wilson and, and Hall. The, I mean, Lazard had one of the worst games you'd ever see no, a big-time player have. I mean, uh, Osama well, dropped the touchdown. Awful. They're That's all, not a great offense. Well, their offensive line stinks. And all the pre-snap penalties, I'm sorry, fall on the coach. We're going to have to you know, bring it up to Salah. Again, penalties killing them. But there is no way in the world, guys, seriously. And unfortunately, the two teams that are in this boat both play in this city where a 14-point lead is completely insurmountable. Once it, once it became 14 nothing with more than half the fourth quarter left, it was over. It was over. Over. Wait, it was 17-3, was, it was, it was, 14-0 oh, and 17-3. Oh, then it went back to 14. Right, again. It, got, yes, saying, yes, it got so, to 11 at one point. Right, it was right. 11 at one point, it went back to 14. So they kicked that But it field felt goal. insurmountable on the first time no, at 14-0. No, I, 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 I didn't say anything to the guy. I let it go. Finish up the Nick game. I'm packing up my uh, my stuff because we do a little back and forth with Pat O'Keefe in the post game, and they're letting all the By fans. By the way, go. big Nick win. Big, yeah, needed we'll get, that. We'll get needed to that one. And Randall was back. Guy in full jet garb, hat, jacket, jersey. I'm like, well, you're in the wrong building. And he's like, the Jets are going in for a touchdown. They're on the 11 yard line. I'm like, so <laughs> what makes you think they're going in for a touchdown? They live in the red zone. They don't score touchdowns. They don't. Did you see this stat? This will blow you away if you didn't see it. Over the last five years, here are the top three teams in games without a touchdown scored. Number three, the Houston Texans with eight. Number two, the New York Giants with nine. The Jets are number one with 16 how many since when? Sixteen since in the last when? five years. Five years. games without a touchdown. Five years? <laughs> Sixteen times. I, you know, I, I, That's I, an I, entire season of not scoring a touchdown. I tweeted uh, last night during the game. I don't know why I bothered to <clears throat> qualify with that. Watching this team play offense is so painful. The only team that you can compare to it is the Giants. Right. They are they they, they are playing a brand of football right now. These two teams. It, it's all it's unwatchable. Well, that's that's the funniest part of all of this, though. Well, you know they're, they're going to make the playoff. Well, uh, they might not. They're they're eleventh now in the AFC. They have not lost a tiebreaker with the Chargers, a team that's most likely going to have the same record as them. They're an abysmal team. They're a great team. I thought that Troy Aikman had one of his strongest games ever. Yeah. I mean, he was just spitting truth. He said, this is a terrible offense and a great defense. And I can't say it any better. Their defense is absolutely superb. Their offense is terrible. The, let, let's give it up for the defense for a second. I mean, last night was not just a good performance. The, the Chargers did nothing. They basically offensively did nothing. Special teams gifted them a touchdown. Then you had uh, Zach Wilson put the ball on the ground twice. Late in the game, a another turn over and over yeah. again. It well, was never uh, the defense, Don, that did it. The other stat, that you, it, it's, it sounds like somebody that really needs to go on a date that dug this up. But there are people that get paid a lot of money to figure out these stats. The Jets were the first team last night in the Super Bowl era to have five sacks, allow the opposition less than 200 yards, and 
lose by three touchdowns. Like it, it's just incredible. There was another stat there too that just quickly escaped me. Like they're doing. It's weird when they win games. It's like how did they do that? And when they lose games, it's oh my god, how did they lose? Did they? Because the defense is great. Now listen, the special teams for the first time had the breakdown with the punt return, which you just can't have happen. Because the punt was he out kicked his coverage, right, but, and it was but, a little low. But for the most part. They've got great special teams and great defense. It's not enough in this league. It's an offensive league. You've got to score points. You've got to score touchdowns. You can't ask your defense to shut the opposition down. They did a great job against a really good offensive team to give them plenty of chances to win that game, and the offense just can't do it, Michael. No, it, they couldn't even score a, a lousy token touchdown at the end of the game. I, I don't want to go through the same thing again. We've been doing this since the summer. Yeah. Peter and I have been on the same train. How do you go into the no, season with Zach Wilson but, as your backup quarterback? It, it's inexcusable. But, it's professional malfeasance. However, he's not a quarterback that's going to win in this league. I am not going to sit here and spend a day. I don't want to take phone calls from people supporting Zach Wilson. I don't want to be known as the guy that supports Zach Wilson. Michael, it is what it is. But isn't last night kind of a reminder that it might not necessarily have been a panacea with Rodgers? It would be way better. But your offensive line can't protect the quarterback. So would Rodgers eventually get hurt in another way? All the pre-snap penalties. Now, now I'm sure Rodgers would help with that, too. But still, penalties are killing them. Uh, and why, are they, why do they get off the slow starts? They, they never get, a, even in games they win, they spot the opposition points. Philadelphia scored on their first possession. Always. The Giants scored on their first possession. And that's why I also, in, in spite of the fact that, obviously, Zerline's been great, and generally speaking, special teams has been good, you can't let them get up from yesterday. Because your special teams is asked at this point. You cannot allow them to get down 7 nothing. You do not have enough offense on this team to make a mistake well, like that. When they started in the hole like that, guys, come on. We all knew the game was over but, then. But, Peter, their offense is so non-existent, or if you want to say just so pathetic, that the other factors of the team, the special teams and the defense, have to be perfect. So, I mean, the defense allowed that one touchdown drive when they started on the 50. They can't right. allow it. And it's not fair. Their defense is but, is amazing. And their offense is so predictable and so bad. And, again, I'm not jumping totally on Zach Wilson. No, that, that, he was mostly bad. No, he's awful. He was awful. He but was, he, but, you could say he was awful for many reasons, too. The penalties, as Don said, the fact that he has no time to throw. Because when he has time to throw, he's got a great arm and he made some nice passes. Mm -hmm. But can we, since, since you guys are both currently playing the role of sort of not beating up Zach. Well, I, I beat him up enough. Can I just throw out one moment that I have to beat him up on that just shows you're just like, what do you not? The, 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 the play when the play breaks down and he's clearly going to take off for a first down and decides at that moment to pitch the ball to Brees Hall when he had like eight yards in front yeah. of him to well, just it, scamper for a first down. He, there's something that doesn't connect it doesn't that with fire. every other quarterback it, fires. It, it doesn't fire. And, and and that's really the difference. They all If you've made it to the NFL level, they've all got big arms. They've all got ability. But it's the idea to be able to see it. Like, you can look at DeVito on Sunday. Like, yeah, he could throw the ball, but there were times guys are open for an instant. He doesn't see it, and then the play goes away because you've got to fire. You have to fire immediately. It's not just physical. It's the mental part of the game, too. Also, the game was already over. They're down 14. They're, they're close to midfield, I guess, maybe at the 35, 40-yard line. I don't know if you remember, like, that last – he takes a 17-yard sack. Like, you were going to go for it. Throw the ball away. You're going to go for it. But now you can't go for it because it's fourth and 27 because you took a 17-yard sack. That killed him in the Giant game, too. How do you take a sack on fourth down? What, was Just it, throw it up for grabs. What, Don, wasn't it one of the field goal drives? They, they moved the ball down the field pretty quickly. And then on second and third down, he was sacked back-to-back yeah. back and just it, killed. Yeah, it, it's brutal. He can't operate in the red zone. He cannot do right. it. He cannot but, get a ball into the end zone on a throw. And the one that he did, Ozama uh, dropped see, at the end of the game. That's the other Couldn't thing, Couldn't even too. get a cosmetic touchdown. He's dropping there. Lazard's dropping passes. A Lazard's penalty. The penalty. See, so, and, and then Garrett Wilson had um, well, the his fumble, temper. Fumble, yeah. well, well, the fumble, but then he lost his temper and took an illegal block to the back on the next play. And they end up blue. It just there's a lot going on here. So yeah, Aaron Rodgers would help. And and we, as we look to trying to survive and stay alive, if Rodgers is going to come back, and he hinted that maybe he'll be back in a few weeks. Although he debunked that on McAfee, we'll get to that in a second. Or even if he's around next year, guys, you want to win a championship. There's a lot of other things you got to clean up. So not apologizing for Zach Michael. I don't think you're apologizing no. for him either. And we can't kill the defense. The defense, to me, you can't play better. Because no, they're on the field all day. And as you said, you got to be perfect. 
They may be the but, best. They may be the best in the league. But they're, they're that. But they're this very, offensive very line has got to clean things up, and the pre-snap penalties, and the not ready to start games. I mean, that was a huge, huge game yesterday, and it just—it's killer. It really is a killer. Now they're still very much alive, but again, guys. How much better do you have to play to navigate through the rest of this schedule? They're very much alive by accident. They should not have won the Giant game. They did. You can't take it away from them. But through the Giants' absolute ineptitude is why they won that game. They should have lost. They got outplayed. They got outplayed yesterday. Every single expert on ESPN picked the, uh, the Jets. Everyone. Everybody is, everybody is drinking the Kool-Aid with this team. It's not a great team. It's not a playoff team. A great defense does not make a playoff team. And the offense doesn't have to be great. All the offense has to be is decent, not the worst. And it's the worst. It's the worst. Yeah, well, and Jet fans could call in, and I, I saw it yesterday, too. Kay's such a hater. you got to stop him out the Jets. Look with your eyes. Stop being uh, fanboys. Look with your eyes and see with the way this team is playing. And this team is absolutely dreadful. They can't get out of their own way. And you could blame Zach Wilson, but the penalty that's on the coaches the unimaginative offense that's on the coaches as well and one other thing Aaron Rodgers so great for the team the two addendums to Aaron Rodgers being on the Jets Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb have been dreadful and Randall Cobb was a healthy scratch with a team that doesn't have that many uh, wide receivers Randall Cobb couldn't get on the 58 man a 53 man roster and Alan Lazard almost lost the game by himself those are the things that came with Aaron Rodgers. So Aaron Rodgers better get back and lead this team to the Super Bowl because right now all of this is a mess. They're not a great team. They're not a playoff team. They're just not. Yeah, and Billy Turner's here too because of him, and he hasn't been good. It's it, there's there's a lot going on here, and it stinks because there's there, there there's such a chance here, but this NFL. Cleveland's got a great defense, but their offense has been dysfunctional with Watson and out. And where, where are they? Four and four. Like, this is not the old days where you know the the the, the Bears can just have a uh, an okay offense and their defense was dominant. Or even the two thousand Ravens. You got to score points in this league. But, but, you got to do it. the Ravens score. Points. Ravens have a great defense. They score points. 49ers have a great defense. They score points. But at least Deshaun Watson is a, a legitimate right. quarterback he'll, he'll when he's healthy. See, that's the thing is they'll eventually figure it out. They'll stay healthy right, and they'll so score points. Here's the question. Is it time to replace Zach? Is it time to put in Trevor well, Simeon? I, I I don't know why you wouldn't give it a shot at this point. I guess they won't, Michael, because they he's not even he's on the practice squad. He's not even backing up. So why even have the conversation when it's not going to happen? But why wouldn't you try something else to see if maybe you can get a touchdown? We don't we don't register wins based on yardage it's based on points scoring touchdowns they don't score touchdowns so would i give trevor Simeon a try yeah but the the jets won't he's on the practice squad he's not if zach wilson got hurt on the first play from scrimmage then they, he would trevor Simeon wouldn't be able to play he's not dressed but you can get him out the practice squad and but, start him but why aren't you getting him out the know. practice squad i don't know i don't know again it's it, it's that it, 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 it was same thing with the giants why is devito on your team when we saw Josh Dobbs go out there, didn't start because he didn't know the offense, and then balls out and wins the game on his isn't own. It, isn't it just another crazy thing, though? Like, how much of it is it about the team they're on and the systems they're in? Like, what well, is it? How could a guy like Joshua Dobbs, he was on a team that was intended to lose. They made him the starter. We all laugh. <laughs> Joshua Dobbs, a couple weeks in, you go, that guy's not too bad. Now he got picked up by a team who's trying to have a chance. Why can the why can the teams here well, not find someone? Uh, is it the arrogance of the coaches? Well, my system's too complicated for you to understand. You've got to sit there and watch film for 37 days before you can understand my genius. Or is it, you know what? Make a turn at the Jeep. Stop at the manhole, and I'm going to find you open. If, if I'm desperate to score points, why can't it be that simple? And, and, Just do it. And also, good coaches and, can make it work because I'll tell you what, the Vikings offense is complicated. That guy is like a guy who really knows how to manipulate defenses, and the guy came in, didn't even know the names of the players, but, and engineered a drive but you know to win. What? We, need to, we need to win to save our, te save our uh, season. You know, let's go out there and we'll figure it out. We'll, 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 we'll get you to know the system later. Now let's just try to win. And also, Nathaniel Hackett, can you do something that doesn't involve Aaron Rodgers? Now, they tried a little something different. They tried to speed things up, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? So they tried speeding things up early and still.
Nothing. Nada. It's, it's, it, it, I was so angry watching that game because this defense is championship level worthy. That's how good this defense is to make that quarterback look so inept, so inept. And you can't put an offense that's even decent. How about this about how much the defense is on the field? This is according to Rich Samini on X. The Jets have the lowest third down rate in 45 years, according to Elias. It could be longer, but their third down stats only go to 1978. They can't. No. They can't stay on the field. They can't pick up third downs. It was because um, it was right after Vietnam, and they realized that you know we're not at war anymore. So now we can actually write stats down. Pre nineteen seventy eight, nobody bothered to to track anything, which is ridiculous. But anyway, the, it, and now you get in these obvious passing situations. They're just going to pin their ears back. And you know what's going to happen, Michael? You know what's next? Zach Wilson's going to get hurt. And and also, were you thinking this, guys? I, I don't. I would not have played him in that final suit. You weren't winning the game. They're pinning their ears back. You could see they're all just licking their chops to get sacks. Why am I having my quarterback get beat up? Why? Why is he in there that last? What just, just to score a token touchdown, which they didn't anyway. I think that's what it was for to give him. Some, they wanted to give him some confidence. Right. But I, I'm sitting here right now. The phones, you know the number. I want the Zach Truthers to call up. I want them. The ones that rip me for saying he's not, oh, look, his, his, uh, his completion percentage is 68%. He doesn't put the ball in the end zone. He doesn't get third down. Zach Truthers, call wow. up. I want to hear well, from you. you. You know what the Zach Truthers are going to do? They're going to piggyback off your comment that they're dropping passes, the offensive line stinks, and that it's not all Zach, which there's truth to it. It's not all also, Zach, but it's a lot of Zach. But also... Uh, everything kind of goes through the quarterback. So how much of these pre-snap penalties because of him? Because remember, when Aaron Rodgers came in, he was the one preaching to the guys about no my cadence. We can't have pre, uh, we can't have uh, penalties before the snap. So how much is that on the quarterback? The drop passes, they are, some of them are just awful drops, but some of them are not put in the right place. It always comes back to the quarterback, guys. All right, let's take some phone calls. 1-800-919-3776. Let's go to Jorge in New Jersey. Jorge. What's up, guys? All right, I am not a Jets or Giants fan, but dude, I'm, this is getting criminal, and it's insane. This kid is equivalent to Paxton Lynch. The only difference is Paxton Lynch got five career NFL starts. The fact that they keep letting this kid go out and play quarterback in the NFL is insane. Stop. I don't want to watch it no more. Change him. Let him go. Stop. Put in Trevor Simeon. Trevor Simeon can't throw touchdowns. I've watched him for the Broncos. He had great games. Uh, I get, Zach Wilson is garbage. Garbage. Stop letting him play. I'm tired of watching. Well, I think a lot, a lot of what's going on. I, I like think, that. That could be the point. Oh, anyway, he wasn't even a, a Jets not, fan. No, no, that was literally just it's anger for being fan. a football fan. Right. And, I, and by the way, and I get it. And I don't want to beat the kid up anymore. And I'm sick of us beating him up. But the Jets have been lying to our face now for two years, trying to tell us, that, Michael, we're seeing a pile of horse manure. And they're like, that's a that's a sirloin steak. Just you gotta wait. It'll turn into well, a sirloin steak. Unfortunately, it's not. unfortunately, Don has brought this up a couple of times in the last couple of months. I think there's something political in this. I, I think there's something political. He was the second choice in the draft, and they don't want to look like complete idiots but, for having drafted him. So let's have but, him back up Rodgers. If God forbid, so, you know, he could he could fill in for two or three games. They didn't think that Rodgers would be out for the whole year. He can't play in this league at this point. He should not be the quarterback of a team that has a defense that 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 is that stout. He can't. He shouldn't. But as Don said, the milk is out of the udder, the cow's out of the barn, whatever you want to say. What about the toothpaste? The season's over now. Well, toothpaste but, is but, out but, of the tube. Here's the scary thing, though, because you can you can pass that along when you're winning games. But now if you lose the season and Aaron Rodgers is right and Mike Greenberg's right and he's available to come back in week 13, week 14, week 15, you think he's going to come back to a team that's just playing out the string? So as if you're Sala... If if you're Douglas, you gotta find you a way. gotta find a way to win to keep things alive. If Rodgers comes back, and you gotta ask yourself, I don't know, I don't watch Trevor Simeon. I, I've seen him play. I don't know what he's like now. But you went out and signed him. Shouldn't you start thinking about trying to develop something for him to try to win you game? You are not scoring touchdowns, and Rodgers might. How would that look, Michael, if Rodgers is cleared to play, 
but won't because the Jets are mathematically eliminated. Well, he, today's Tuesday, so he's on with Pat McAfee, and he, Pat asked him, do the Jets have to be competing for you to return? I have a lot of faith in our guys, and I feel like we're going to be in the mix for sure. That is a very small part of the thought process because it's really just the day-to-day -day trying to get better, trying to keep strengthening the calf, trying to, you know, as we move into this, you know, more flexibility down there. But it's going to be a process, small gains every single day. Um, and then hopefully there's a chance to have that conversation. Obviously, you know, we got to be in the mix. There's, there's no doubt about it. But, but more than that, I got to be able to be healthy, to be able to move, to be able to protect myself, to be able to have strength. Uh, in all the throwing positions. I can do a little simulated gun drop, left, right, left, right. I even did a little crossover last night. I'm feeling a lot, <laughs> feel a lot more strength in the Achilles, but we're a long way off from being able to be under center and get out to an outside zone and get out to a keep fake. And it's going to be a process, but I like where I'm at. I mean, definitely, obviously, ahead of schedule. Uh, I think Don said a mouthful earlier. Well, why would he want to come back and, and play behind this line? They don't have weapons either. They don't. They have Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall. That's what they have. That's not a weaponized offense. It's just not. Why would he why would he rush back to this? Why would he put his health in peril to come back and play for a team well, also, that can't protect and him? And I'm not going to kill him for that. I mean, uh, listen, he he wants to play. He's going to be 40 years old in December. He came to the Jets because he thought that gave him the best chance to win. He liked the talent here. But right now, this line would not be able to protect him. He'd be foolish to come back if the games are meaningless. Crazy. Be crazy. Todd and Olean. Todd. Oh. Oh, okay. Hello, Todd. Yeah, hey, Michael. Hello, Todd. Um, listen, do you have time to explain this? You can hear me, right? Yeah, oh, sure. sure. Okay, listen. I'm not a Jets fan. I was when Namus was there. I loved it when they beat the Colts. But anyways... The deal is, is I'm watching the game last night, and I'll agree with you on three things. One, the offensive play calling stunk. Three games I watched this weekend, awful, for OCs. My Notre Dame team, the Bills, and the Jets last night. Well, one thing I'll tell you, no Zach Wilson at this stage of his career, maybe he'll reach it someday, maybe he'll be an NFL quarterback. But you got to get some receivers that can catch. Your Ohio State product. He dropped the ball last night. He had his hands around it, and boom, it's, it's popping out. Did you mean Garrett Wilson? Well, Garrett, Garrett, we're not, we're not going to. Garrett, okay. Garrett, Garrett Wilson is the best, best thing they have. If the call starts with the, the Ohio State receiver, I, I'm sorry, bud. We're, we're, we're off to a bad start. Sherwin in Brooklyn. Sherwin. Hi, guys. Um, I mean, I've been a supporter of Zach Wilson for a long time, but I think it's time we just. It's time for us to move on. But the thing about that is, is Simeon or Ball a, a bad option than him? It can, well, here's the question, Shoreen. Can he be worse? Can he be worse? I mean, Simeon's been in the league a while. Can he be worse? Because all the people that look at Zach through green glasses and see something that is not there, including the coaching staff and the front office, they've got to have a, a come-to-Jesus meeting with themselves. They have to. He's not good. He's not good. He can't do it. He's had opportunity after opportunity. He has glimpses. I, I give you all of that. He has glimpses. There was a drive yesterday that he looked great as they moving it, but then into the red zone, it's a different Two sacks. Oh, let's see, that the red zone is a major, major issue. And I know Robert Sal is going to tell you that we're, we're getting there. Great. You're great between the 20s. Got to score touchdowns. The, their yeah. offense essentially is Erwin. That's it. Yeah, and good luck kicking field goals in your way to even even as a seven seed to be able to get to the playoffs. All right, we're waiting on Robert Sala. We'll talk mm. to him at some point this hour. Continue to take your phone calls. Hey, the Hess truck is back, and it's better than ever. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. I text Peter on Friday. I stumbled upon this song on Sirius XM. This, this year old song. Literally next week, it'll be the 20th anniversary of this song. One of the great hip-hop songs of all time. Yeah. I know it exists. I've heard it referenced, maybe. referenced in brief little snippets here and there. For the first time, last Friday, I heard the song in its entirety. Unbelievable! Downloaded it instantly. I've I flying to Minnesota. I must have listened to it on a loop twenty times. Jacob, how much you love time. the story? 
<laughs> it's crazy. I love Don LaGreca, and I learn something more about him every day. Well, every day you learn something. He, he hit me up the other day completely in earnest. Just I, I, I discovered this 99 problem. I got to tell you, this is... This is something. But don't make it sound like I didn't no, know No, he was it aware existed. of it. I, of course, how are you not aware of it? Uh, he was aware of it, but the way, and now you can have a whole different appreciation for the fact that, you know, nearly 20 years ago, right around 20 years ago, maybe 19 years ago, he did Glastonbury, and after, and after Oasis had dissed him and said, what is Glastonbury doing, doing hip-hop at Glastonbury? This is ridiculous. How could a hip-hop artist headline that he opened up by playing Wonderwall, Wonderwall with a guitar around him, his neck, and then the second it ended went right into if you haven't girl problems. You can appreciate that moment now. Let's appreciate more of what Brian Cashman. Oh, sure. Are you sure you want to do that? Yeah, this is because uh, Yankees fans have 99 problems, and Brian Cashman <laughs> is the biggest one here's by far. Here's Brian. We lost enough not to make the postseason, but then what happens with a big market? You get a lot of people with a lot of opinions you're getting from outside the organization that are throwing daggers from inside the organization, different people that are actually you work with that, that have strong opinions of, well, if we went this way versus that way, and it starts playing out in the papers and everybody starts picking you apart, that's what happens when you lose. So I don't like losing. I don't like not making the playoffs. Our fans deserve better. Our owner deserves better. So we're back at it trying to figure it out. That, yeah, that does involve a lot of tough conversations, but. I do understand that it's important to separate what's real right. versus what's not real. What's just crap noise versus what, hey, that's action items right there. And that's what we're doing. I promise you that's what we're doing. I mean, do we have to go ahead and do deep dives by publicly gutting ourselves and telling you everything we're doing internally as we assess what we've got going on? No, but I do want to share a few different bullet points like I just did earlier to kind of correct the narratives as, like, people say we're over-analytically driven. Well, what I could say, okay? Okay, I know that one deal that was analytically driven. I, I mean, what's analytically driven? Every team deals with analytics. Every single team. To what extent? That's only known internally. And I don't think it, it matters the amount of people that you have. It matters the amount of information that's funneled to players and coaches. Again, nobody knows that other than Aaron Boone and his coaches and the players. Joey Gallo was an analytically driven acquisition. Did they ever check with people that said Joey Gallo cannot function in New York City? He can't. They didn't because he's an analytic dream. So, again, I understand what Brian's saying. It's not like they're the only team doing this. Every team does it. To what extent? That's the secret. We'll never know. The analytic guys do not sit there on the podium. It's Aaron Boone. So we don't know. Only they know. So you're saying you know the biggest analytics Group in the and AL East. Okay, I believe you. But a lot of decisions the Yankees have made have been analytically driven. A lot. I'm not saying on the field. I'm saying player yeah, I, acquisition. And a lot of them worked out. Like the analytics groups of the Yankees, they found a Clay Holmes. This guy is much better than he's been pitching with the Pirates. He's turned out to be great. There's a lot of those instances, especially see, with relief pitchers. But there have been a lot of moves is. that were bad, too. I like Hal a lot. And I, and I do feel bad when Hal gets criticized for not caring, not spending money, and all that. If he really cares about this fan base today, he has to talk to Brian Cashman and say, you were, you were out of line. Your tone, the way that you spoke to the media and to the fans today is out of line. Because basically what Brian Cashman was saying is you guys are too stupid to understand what we do. How dare you criticize us? We're the Yankees. We're smart, you're dumb. But in effect, like, we're the lions and you're the sheep. He was Evan Neal. Brian Cashman was Evan Neal today. Boom. And boom, I don't have to tell Yankee fans to do that. I think they know. But, Michael, am I, am I wrong? I mean, like, how cares about the fan? He's spitting in the face of the fans. I understand it frustrates you when you're the smartest guy in the room. I get it. We go through it all the time, right? Fans all think they know more than we do, and you and you go through all that, and you have to deal with it. But, but he is an employee of the New York Yankees, and their job is to sell tickets to their fan base. And he just told their fan base, "You're too stupid to understand what we do. How dare you criticize us?" I, I, Michael, sometimes you got to bite your tongue and just say the right thing. And I think those things, absolutely think them. But when you say them out loud, it's arrogant and it disrespects your fan base. He is going to get destroyed for this. And I hope Hal talks to him because Hal gets it with the fans. Brian's losing people talking like that, this. He, I, he has to be getting a text after all these come I, out. I don't know. I, because this seems to me to be a strategy, Cotton. This is a strategy. <laughs>
It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. <laughs> I think that they all sat down. How are we going to approach this? That was a great point. How are we going to approach this? And we'll go on the offensive. I, I, and the, I, I don't think it, they thought it was. And I don't think it was at the fans. My, they, they have, uh, you know, the, um, friendly fire. They got. They get it. This is to all of us, all of the people that yeah, criticize but, it, the two analytics. I think it was to some people within the organization, too, that pushed back but, against Brian because you he, heard that, too. I know, but he has to understand how that is going to be perceived. All right? He's talking to the media. The media is going to write it. It's being tweeted. The video's out there right now. Peter, you look at the video. You can see he's angry. And I get it. He's a human being, and he wants to be angry. But you've got to respect your fans and understand where they're coming from. Every my, you, we said, but when we did it with the Evan Neal, right? All the players probably agreed with Evan Neal, but they don't say it because they know that's not what you say. Can't say it. Brian to attack, even if it's just attacking the media and the people that analyze baseball. Who are you to talk like you invented the game of baseball? That you're above reproach? That how dare anybody criticize you? Uh, that's 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 not right to do, especially when you haven't won a championship since 2009. And one championship in what going on twenty three years. Uh, this this tells me they're not going to make any major moves. And the way that they're defending running it back is they think they have a good team. If not for the injuries and things didn't go right, that's it's the only way you can interpret it. So that he's getting aggressive. That yeah. everybody's wrong. And he can be aggressive, Michael, because he's got a job for life. There's a lot of general managers can't do that because they get called on the carpet. The fans would revolt, and eventually, if you end up losing again, you'd get destroyed and you'd lose your job. Doesn't he talk like somebody, Peter, that's got no shot of ever losing his job? And maybe oh, he's yeah. being a mouthpiece for Hal. Maybe Hal 100% agrees with him. I don't know. But at least when Hal comes on, he at least puts on the front that he feels the fans' passion. He feels their pain. He's not going to tolerate losing anymore. What does Brian say? We're fine. And how dare you question us? Let's go to Justin in New Jersey. Justin. He's got to be kidding, right? Like, <laughs> Brian Cashman is now public enemy number one for this entire fan base. This is a joke. Like, I, I, I checked out after the All-Star game last year. I won't watch the team this year. And it's I can't. he's getting torn apart right now on Twitter. And luck, rightfully so. I, I'm literally in shock that he actually said something this stupid. Well, I'll let you know a little secret, Justin. So... Don started reading a quote, which I had seen moments before. Right. And I didn't read it, Peter, because I thought it was a farce. I, uh, there's no way he said this. Oh, you thought, you thought it was uh, Sports Pickle? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't want to be New York Sports. sports. <laughs> I didn't read it. I swear to God. I, I, because I, I trust Andy Martino as, as much once as I, anybody. Once I confirmed it was his account, I right. thought it was but, comfortable. And I like said, I'm said. Not, somebody, somebody hacked Andy Martino. I thought that it was such an aggressive. Which, which one are we referring to? Oh, I think we're pretty bleeping good. And then you hear. I mean, the you're 82 and 80. God bless you. But 82 and 80, your record. Let's the, let's the, quote old Bill Parcells. Your record is. You, know, you are what your record. I mean, the you. Orioles finished 18 games ahead of you, pal. Uh, really? That's why I didn't read it, Tom. That's why I almost stopped you. <laughs> you <right. did. laughs> yeah, no, I saw your face, and then I got worried. Like, oh, is maybe it, I got. Because I thought it says, that that was so aggressive that if I read it and it was not real, that I, I would people had a right to rip me. Right. But it was real. Once I saw it was Andy's account, you know, I'd like, like to, right. I'd like to apologize, actually. Why? Music. <laughs> Earlier in the show, I disparaged this day, the day when we hear from the Yankees brass, because it's generally boring. Nothing yes. is said of any interest, any import. They just kind of say, hey, nothing to see here. We're going to do our best. We're going to do X, Y. I did not know. Brian Cashman was going to become that meme of the dog and the fire in the background. <laughs> I, I did not know that Cash was going to go out like this. I, this is Brian Cashman as Scarface in the, every version you want. I mean, he's just going hard in a way I did not expect at all. Because who would have, and guys, you know what kind of gall I'm referring to. Unmitigated. That's right. <laughs> who would have the unmitigated gall? After this season, to have this approach it, in a bizarre way, I respect it. Yeah, I know. I, hear uh, what you're I saying. sort of like like the fact that he's real, but at the same time, the problem is these arguments are won and lost with your record, and and you already lost in this past season. Well, how about this? He he goes on, 
to defend oh, here we go. the acquisitions of Gallo and Gray. I get a kick out of like Joey Gallo gets named on, but since Joey Gallo left us, who's picked him up? Two playoff teams. The Dodgers traded him for us, and then the Twins, who just made the playoffs. Or Sonny Gray, he's currently in the competition for a Cy Young Award, right? It's interesting how they get written about these players. I get it, because whether they can play in New York or not, which is always a difficult thing, I don't care what anybody says, it's not easy to determine who can. You have to make decisions, try to engage people. I feel like we got to adjudicate the Joey Gallo decision over and over again. We went all in. We were out of balance. We needed a left-handed bat. It was a very limited market. I had a guy that played with him on our roster at the time. Odor, hey man, what's he like? Can he play in New York? I think he'd be great here. He can handle it, blah, blah, blah. We do the cross-check. We talk to as many people as you can. You make a decision. Then you live with it. Didn't work out. But since that time, the Dodgers wanted them. And since that time, the Twins wanted them. So I get a kick out of how all of a sudden it's decisions about players that are having that are really good Major League Baseball players or potential you know, helpful Major League Baseball players and that we're dumb for getting them and other people, obviously, they're not dumb. Wow, Brian, I, oh I mean, first God. of all, he was terrible with the Dodgers, and here's a little secret. The Twins signed him. He was not on their playoff roster. He was so bad. And Sonny Gray, everybody knows Sonny Gray's a good pitcher. He can't pitch in New York. Nobody said that those were bad acquisitions in terms of talent, although to me, Joey Gallo hitting 190 and striking out 220 times, not a good player. But analytically, they believe he's a great player because he can walk, he can hit home runs, and he actually is a good base runner and a very good defender. He could not fit in New York. You ask Rugnet Odor, I, I talked to 10 people when that trade was made. They go, disaster. Did, I talked to 10 people. He cannot play in New York. But you ask Rugnet Odor. And Sonny Gray is a really good pitcher, but not in New York. I'm shocked. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. <laughs> it's not going to pay off. I, I, again, I'm There's so sorry. Prediction. <laughs> I did not know it was going to be like this. The man brought heat. All right. You bring heat right now, Peter. I will. Get ready to start the NFL Week Off play. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching, yes. Was 2-0-1, got four and a half points. He's 18-11-2, which is unbelievable, 38 and a half points. Thank you. Don, last week, was 1-1-1, one, one one, finished with three and a half points. He's 14-14-3 with 30 points. I, last week, um, was 1-2, but my one was a three-pointer. So I'm 14-16-1 at 28 and a half. So, Peter, who's been in the lead, he gets to pick first. Hey, how's everyone feeling today? Cool. Cool. I think that says a lot. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. <sighs> Obviously not happy about losing the two-pointer last night. I'd do it again. Um, but I probably wouldn't do it again if I'd known that Joe Burrow might leave in the first half and never return. But you know what? This is foosball, and these are the things that happen in foosball games, and you have to live with it. So I will give you guys my one-point play. It has not been pretty when I've touched this team this year, but on a slate that I'm not in love with, I don't care what the numbers say. I don't care what the history says. I don't care what Michael says. Uh, I believe that the Giants have checked out. I believe they're thinking about Caleb Williams. Mm. And I believe the Washington Commanders, with the change at center, have found a much better offensive stride. In case you're not paying attention, uh, quarterback Sam Howell is leading the NFL in yards from scrimmage. Um, he is quietly becoming a dude, an actual dude. 2,700 yards, 17 touchdowns, and nine interceptions. Don, if you could just remove that Bills game, it's 17 touchdowns over five interceptions. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take the commanders, uh, giving the eight and a half points. This is the rare situation where I think they'll come up big at home. I think it'll be 27-10, something of that nature. Just don't have the respect for Tommy DeVito. If it's Daniel Jones, I probably lay off this game. But guess what? If it's Daniel Jones... It's not an eight and a half point line. My three, the, my three point play, Don. You know that three, on weeks three, like this, three, three, three. when I don't know where to go, I go with the team that I could get wrong. But for the last couple of years, if you bet them at this time of year, 
you don't generally get it wrong. And that would be my Detroit Lions, who are giving seven and a half points at home to the Bears, um, who can be frisky, but I expect them to go nighty nighttime as Detroit gets ready for their big Thanksgiving clash against Green Bay. They won't look past the division rival, and they'll cover big at home, and you'll be going, why didn't I pick Detroit? Yeah. They won by 30. Well, that's why we're going with Detroit as my 3-3-3-point three, three, three play. Don, you're up next. All right. Well, that hook scared me a little bit. Otherwise, I think I would dive into the Lions. It's not a great week, but I, I know this line looks a little fugazi. I'm not sure why it's only six, but it's under a touch. The Texans are playing so well both offensively and defensively. I mean, the Cardinals, they do come up with these moments, and that was a great win, come from behind against the Falcons, but it was the Falcons, and it was home. Now the Texans, the building's going to be up for grabs. They're very much in the thick of a playoff race. I like the Texans to cover the six at home against the Cardinals in my one-point play. And much like you with the, the uh, Lions, I took a look at what the Niners did last week in completely dismantling a playoff team in Jacksonville. In Jacksonville. They came off the bye. They're finally healthy. This 49er team is going to get back to what they were before that three-game losing streak. I think they're going to go on a run. I'm not scared by the 12. Buccaneers are not a great team. They're going to turn the ball over. I love the 49ers. to cover the 12 at home against the Buccaneers is my two-point play. It's unfortunate I do not have a three-point play. We'll go Niners, my two-point play, and we will go with the Texans as my one-point play. One, two, wow. three-point play. All right, so I hit the two-pointer yesterday, so my one-point play, uh, I'm going to go with Don. I like the 49ers a lot. The 49ers are 13-2 and two against the spread in the last 15 games as a home favorite, and overall 10-2 and two against the spread at home since the start of last season, and I think they found themselves, and they're healthy, and the Bucks. You know what? Their defense used to be a hallmark. Not so much anymore. So I think the 49ers could choose the score. Will they run it up? We'll see. But uh, if they choose the score, I think they'll win by about 30. So that's my one-point play. And my three-point play, I'm going to take the Giants, given eight and a half. I really loved it at nine and a half. Wow. But uh, my three-point play is the Giants. Um, wow. they, they seem like they have Washington's numbers. And it's this, just this year they lost four. They they already beat them fourteen to seven. They weren't able to protect Howell as Peter mentioned earlier. Mm. That has certainly turned around. They have certainly protected him more. And the Giants are taking a big step back in terms of uh, sacks with nine sacks in just nine games. So they had six against Washington. So they have fifteen sacks. Six of them have come against Washington. Um, Kayvon is questionable. Okereke is questionable. Oh, Jalari's questionable. That all gets me nervous, but I am going to take the Giants. I think they're going to win out right. I really love this at nine and a half in terms of a betting proposition. Eight and a half scares me a little bit, but I have to be a man of my word, so I'll take the Giants for my three-point play, three, and I'll take three, the eight and three, a half. Three, three. Did you get the Monday Night Football pick from the manager? He loves his Eagles. He's now, he's now sending me emojis. Where yeah, that's all just, he talks in. He, he's like a, he's like he's like a grandparent. He just talks in emojis. And, and he's spelling out eagles with the low. It's he's really proud of his. Wait, wait. How does he pr spell out eagles with emojis? Because it's just uh, an e pops up, then an a, then a g. Like it, it's, it's, that's how he's doing it. Oh. I could forward it to if you want to see it. I'd love to see it. Excuse me. All right. Uh, <laughs> I have incarcerated Bob. Okay. Who, you know what, Peter? Uh, incarcerated Bob do fifteen to twenty picks if he likes. He's got the Lions minus seven and a half. He has the Vikings getting two and a half, which I consider, and the Rams getting one. Um, Bear the dog, you know, he's very, he's very thoughtful. He likes the Chiefs, given the points at home, which I, he's I going up love. against Boone, going right up against Boone. Yeah, I'm not saying that Bears are Swifty, but I'm just saying he's feeling, he's feeling what he's feeling. And how about 45? Glad you asked. I'm going to Jacksonville. Jacksonville, Florida. Great state with a very small, small, pathetic governor. That's but a true. wonderful state. And I'm going with the Jags. Given seven. Give me Trevor. He's not pretty. But I'll go with him. And does God have a pick? 
glad you brought it up. You know, and, and by the way, I just want to say, a lot's been going on today on the show, and this week in general, and I just think sometimes we all just need to... <sighs> Woosa. You know what I mean? Um, and listen, I gotta tell you, I'm in lockstep with Peter. It, it's the Lions. Well, what are you guys thinking? I mean, listen, it, it's me. God, I'm telling you. Seven and a half is nothing. God, the hook scared you? You, you could have taken the Lions at minus ten and a half, thirteen. Take the Lions, relax. And God, you're okay with Dan Campbell biting kneecaps. You know, Dan Campbell's a complicated figure. Uh, we talk about him a lot up here. Me, uh, JC, Moses, uh, Muhammad. We all chat. And, uh, yeah, Campbell's a strange one, man. I love that guy. He's wacky, but I, but I love him. And we love Ian Ennis. Coming up in just a moment, the announcer lineup, all the pertinent information you need to enjoy your weekend with football. And before we break, we tell you about Empire Outlets on Staten Island. <laughs> Attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. Welcome back to the show, everybody. So, obviously, the uh, heavy conversation today is about the jet loss yesterday, Zach Wilson's play or bad play, and um, the, the whole city is talking about it. Back page of the post, Flop Wilson, which I, I think... Uh, pretty much eliminated half of the uh, the readers, Don, because I asked our 37-year-old stat maven, do you know what that means? He had no idea because he never heard of Flip Wilson. That's but right. It was a nice try for people of our age. Well, even slightly, I, I don't remember it live, but I do know who Flip Wilson is, but I did not, I was too young to watch it. Right. But I, I devour a lot of information. Yes, you do. And, and I'm sure this, uh, our next guest, our good friend, he knows who Flip Wilson is, and he's the Hall of Famer. Joe Namath, who had very interesting comments on social media yesterday. So we asked him if he'd come on, and he said he would. Joe, it's Michael and Don. Great to talk to you. How you doing? Fellas, I'm doing well, and uh, it's good to be with you, really. I'm looking forward to talking with you. All right, so let, let's obviously the, the, the big point of discussion today is about Zach. Did, let's start with a, with a quasi-positive, Joe. Did you take anything positive out of his performance yesterday? You know, you're talking about Flip. You got me thinking about Geraldine. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> you know what? No, I didn't take anything positive out of it yesterday. It was awful. Why? Why? Yeah. Were you watching? Is yes. anyone watching? I mean, please, when did you ever see a, a well, well, it's Zach, we'll stay on Zach. You sit down? You sit down on the play? You go right down? What happens? I thought you're trying to win and make plays. You quit on a play? Mm -hmm. you, what is going on? It, 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 it's disgusting. Well, and you brought up the coaching. How can a coach make things better for Zach? How can a coach say the locker room's together? How many teams have we been on? Are you telling me there aren't some cats on the defensive side saying, whoa, man, what's wrong with you? Yeah, there's not all harmony in the locker room. And if there is, they need to get rid of the people. You got to get people in there that are competitors and want to fight to win. These guys don't have to be in love with each other. And if, they, if they're if they saying they're in love with each other, they're BSing you. And you got to get rid of them, top to bottom. What would you, if you, if somebody handed you Zach Wilson and said, okay, Joe, make him better, what would you do? Send him to Kansas City to back up against somebody like Mahomes. Maybe he'd learn something. I wouldn't keep him. You know, I've seen enough of Zach Wilson. All right? I've seen enough. Has quick feet, can throw a little bit, but I don't believe what's going on up there. Yeah, that's the thing is that they're saying they believe in him. And they're backing it up, Joe, by not bringing in a, a veteran quarterback. Well, what could be Joe Douglas's motivation at this point with the season teetering of not bringing in somebody that has played in this league before outside of Tim Boyle backing up Zach? He picked these people. Douglas picked these people. 
So he's going to double he down. Won. What's he going to do? I can get rid of everybody. What are you going to start over? Now, Mr. Johnson, hey, these guys aren't picking the right players. They're not doing a good job of coaching. It's evident. I mean, you've you got to look and see if you have an eye about football at all. You see things are haywire. It's too crazy. They need to fix it, and that's getting rid of a lot of people and bringing new ones in. All right, so, Joe, let's let's look at it this way. Obviously, they planned the whole offseason to have Aaron Rodgers, and Robert Sala was just on with the show and said, um, you know, that they, they catered an offense around Aaron Rodgers. Now they've got to find one for Zach Wilson. Do you buy that, and is that a tough thing to transition into a different offense for Zach Wilson? How many months ago was that to learn the offense? How many months ago was that? Come on. Now, Aaron, he got hurt. Okay, well, what do you think you have backups there for? They're ready to go. They're supposed to be ready to go. We're looking at an offense that just doesn't play well. Uh, you, you've got an offensive coordinator that doesn't seem to be calling the right plays. I, I, I just think it, for a fan, for this fan, they need to make major changes from top to bottom. Change. Does that include the head coach? Yes. You think he's part of the problem with Zach? When he's telling me that locker room's together, when he's telling me these guys love one another, yeah, well, thanks a lot. You can go back to whatever place you learn that stuff, but uh, they're losing. Guys don't like to lose. They don't, they're, they're not holding hands when they're losing. Well, here, here's a problem, Joe, that I, I wonder what you would do. <laughs> nobody's, going, <laughs> nobody's going anywhere unless Aaron Rodgers says so. Well, wait a minute. Aaron Rodgers is not coaching the team. He's not Woody Johnson. He, mm. He's not Christopher Johnson. Uh, come on. Uh, and, and and what what guarantees are there other than one that worked out? What guarantees are there that Aaron's going to be able to come back? What are you talking about? Um, uh, you know, you're you're right, team. Joe, but you know how organizations are. I mean, this guy wants to come back, and if he wants Robert Sala to be his coach, if he wants Zach Wilson to be his backup quarterback, it, they're not in any position to say no because they, they want him to come back and play. Well, I don't know that they're not in any position to say no. I, I don't know the, contract, the contracts and how they're, they're structured. Maybe they are locked in, but I know one thing, if you're running that team as ownership, you don't lock yourself into that kind of a situation. Now, in watching him, Joe, uh, him being Zach Wilson, it almost looks like it's not reacting. It's not like using his talents. He's, he's overthinking things, and he's just not letting his talents take over. Are you seeing the same thing as if maybe, maybe he's overcoached? <laughs> I'm saying uh, I don't believe in him I don't believe he has a future as a good player and I think they made a wrong choice when they drafted him I feel that way uh, he has some athletic ability but uh, you've got to have something up here that's you know going on whenever you're studying reading playing out there sitting down Sitting down, throwing the ball, it, 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 it's ridiculous. Uh, you've got the wrong people playing and picking them. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's incredible. There, But there is an arm, there are legs, but is it one of those, <laughs> is it, I, I hate to say it this way, but is this one of the classic, you know, million dollar arm, 10 cent head? Well, I've never met Zach, so I don't know what's going on between the ears. I only know what I see out there. And uh, uh, it, it's hard to tell what's going on between a guy's uh, ears. And uh, the mind does play a major role on your team, in your team, and in every individual in your team. Whatever position they're playing, they have a duty. They have plays to carry out. And they have to do them with regularity. And he's far from that. Well, since they, they don't seem like they're going to make any change and they're, they seem like they're sticking by him, Joe, is, is there something they could do with him, like just make him run the ball? Is there anything they could do to salvage a little bit of the season if they're committed to staying with him? 
they're, if they're committed to staying with him, and I gather they are because they don't have a, 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 I don't know how good the backup quarterback is. The one that they traded away would be a good starter, and it will be someday in white. But meantime, uh, the players all collectively have to play better, and they know that. And uh, I guess you don't point your finger at any one guy, but as a fan, I sure do. Uh, that, the guy that handles that ball and has to make decisions, he, uh, he's got to be right more times than not. And we've been watching him for a couple of years now, and uh, I don't have any confidence in him at all. Is the offensive line good enough even if the quarterback was good? Because, look, Rodgers, it took four plays, and he's out for the season. Do you, do you not like what you see of the offensive line? The offensive line, uh, only in the backyard that I ever play that position. Uh, to me, they have, the, I think, the toughest job uh, when it comes to execution against animals uh, like those defensive fronts and linebackers that are coming. The offensive line needs to improve, that's for sure. All the players out there need to improve. But the offensive line... Do you like Garrett uh, Wilson from what you see of him? They've got to get better real fast uh, or else it, it's... Well, whatever else. It's going to be a long season no matter yeah. what. Now... You're going to lose the room. Joe? I mean, that's just going to happen, especially with the modern-day athlete. That They're not going to want to take a knee on a Joe season, Anthony? Joe. And, and they're, Salah's going to lose the room. If you're a veteran in that room, what what can you say to try to keep everybody together as the losers, losses start to pile up? I'm not going to say if These guys are working for a living. You know, they're working for a living. They're professionals. They're getting paid. They're better play their butts off because that one-eyed monster – called that camera looking at them, evaluating every single move they make out there. That one-eyed monster tells no lies. It doesn't describe it. It shows every team around the league are looking at these films or these tapes. They see what the individuals are doing. Now, Mosley, I count on him. I don't think he's going to quit, and I don't think there's a lot of guys out there that are going to quit. On the defense, on the offense, I don't think their guy's going to quit because that's their living. They know they're being judged and evaluated on each play. They're going to try. They're going to try their best to play. They just don't have the talent up front, in my opinion, offensively. At this time, they can develop, and they certainly don't have the talent with the guy that handles the ball every play and has to make the decisions with the offense every single play. Uh, they, they, they don't have that. They got wide receivers that are outstanding. The defense is pretty darn good. The court, hey, there's good players on that team. You know, Joe, I've never uh, heard you this angry. Is this is this the lowest point for you as a fan of this team? I think so. I, I think so. Uh, I hate losing uh, the fans. Though. I know we, we hate losing. And we were on teams. I was on teams that lost. It stinks. These players don't like losing. They're trying. Meantime, uh, the coaching, are they getting good coaching? I, I, I don't know. It doesn't appear like they are. I mean, calling good plays. And I see running back that wants to run the ball more and, you know, take the getting in arguments on the sidelines with coaches. Hey, something's up that the players aren't happy with the way they're co getting coached. Mm. Yeah, I just, it's so difficult to to make a change uh, during the course of the season. Mm -hmm. I, I was mentioning that this is part of the trouble with having a defensive-minded head coach. I mean, it's such an offensive league now. It is Would things be better if you had an offensive guy as the head coach to at least be able to help the progression of this offense? I, I don't think that that's the major issue here. I think it is the personnel. Uh, and that whether you're a defensive guy like Parcells, who could lead a team to championships or an offensive guy. Uh, no, it's, mm. it's the guys underneath. It's the assistants and the, the, the head coach, uh, even in, in college ball, oversees all of that, and he should be able to recognize what his coaches are doing and convey that to the general manager and go on. You know, But I don't know whether they protect one another or what, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's awful. It's awful, and it's hurting the uh, uh, I had to smile, though, when the guy spit his teeth halfway out of his mouth <laughs> yesterday. That, that's about how most of us felt watching it.
Yeah, 15 straight losses to the Patriots, Joe. I mean, of all teams, too, to lose that many, too. Do you ever remember in your career, whether it was Alabama or with the Jets, that you had a team that just had your number like that? Uh, no, 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 I, I don't recall that. And, and I guess if we look at around the league, uh, are there any other teams that have lost 15 straight to an opponent, a, a, comp or a division opponent? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. And well, certainly not to someone that seems to hate the Jets as much as Bill Belichick does. It just drives Jets fans crazy. We're, we're talking to Joe Namath after another tough day for the Jets after they lose to the New England Patriots. I, I got to ask you as an offensive guy, we brought it up earlier in the show. Miami puts up 70 points against Denver. They can line up for a field goal to break the record. They say, ah, we don't want to embarrass Sean Payton. We're not going to kick it. But don't you think at 70 points, you probably embarrassed them already? Would you be tempted to break the record? Or do you get what Miami did there? I get, I get why Miami didn't uh, try to break the record. There, there is some respect for uh, coaches and players, and uh, you, how much you want to rub it in? You know, they, they, you put seventy points on a team. You've got them. They, 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 no, I, I, I like uh, that the coach didn't go for the field goal. I you? I mean, look at uh, just to put up that many points. Just look at this division, Joe, right? I mean, uh, I think Buffalo's going to be fine. Miami looks like they're legit. Uh, it's it's going to be so difficult, even if the Jets were good, to be able to navigate through some of these good teams in the AFC and even in their own division. Well, if they were good, they'd make it, they'd, they'd make it enjoyable. Well, that's we true. You know, but they're not good. They don't have the personnel for the most part. But they're supposed to be talented. I mean, they've well, got receivers. You really think well, it's a personnel they, they, problem? I think every from the top to the bottom, from general manager to the head coach, down through the system, the way they're running it is it needs changed. God, and but they're it, it's so weird, Joe, because you're not wrong, but at the same time, waiting in the wings, you hope is going to be a healthy Aaron Rodgers next year. How, how much better do you think this team would be if Rodgers didn't get hurt? Or would they eventually get exposed for all the reasons you're talking? I, I have no idea. I just know it would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> How much better? I'm not sure. He, he's the kind of guy that can help out the offensive line, help out the defense just with his decision-making, where he's going with the ball, knowing what's happening. Yeah, you, you can't compare his leadership uh, to anyone's on the, on the Jets team. I mean, we, they, they definitely miss him. He, had, he was a major... Uh, Oh, he was a major warrior to bring in, and we were counting on him. But Lady Luck, darn it, you yeah, know, know what? Hey, yay, you know, man, that's the way it is in life. Life's not always fair, and it, it, it's disappointing, and it's a good thing we're just talking about football. Well, I, I just wonder. They say sometimes you feel better when you got a chance to talk it out. Do you, do you feel any better after this interview or worse? I feel honestly better. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, because I haven't talked to anybody except for my family or my daughter or whatever. I, 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 I And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I feel better that uh, I have at least uh, got it off my wow. chest and uh, explained my feelings about what's going on. Well, we're here for you. If any time you want to vent about your Jets, you've got a place here on the Michael K Show. You know that, right? Well, Michael, all right, and I'm going to be watching the Jets. I'm not quitting no. on them. I'm going to watch them, and I'm pulling for them. But, uh, boy, they need to make some changes, and starting with on the field or on the sidelines or upstairs, man. They, they need to get better. Well, Joe, try to enjoy the rest of the season. We'll talk to you soon. Stay healthy, man. <laughs> all right, we win some games. Uh, we'll enjoy it. All right, that's the great Joe Namath. He wants scorched earth. He, he wants everybody gone. It's a personnel problem. It's a coaching problem. Listen, if, if he's right then where are you going? If you don't have the personnel, which I disagree with, I, I think that there's talent there. But I don't think he's wrong about the coaching at all, especially from Hackett trying to find some way to make it work with his quarterback. You just got to find some way. You know, it wasn't impossible that a quarterback that was going to turn 40 in December would, would be out. And to have some sort of plan B 
And for it to take this long to kind of develop that plan B, I just think is an indictment on the team for sure. But the thing we go with is that, you know, I'm not saying that Aaron Rodgers runs the team, but I'm saying he runs the team. I mean, he's invested so much, even financially, to be a part of this team. So you're going to have to run it by him. And if he wants Robert Sala to be his coach, he wants Nathaniel Hackett to be his general manager and he's happy with the weapons and he's happy with the personnel, then guess what? You're not making any changes. How could you? He's Aaron Rodgers. So and we talked about that when he forfeited that $35 million. He kind of becomes your de facto general manager. He's going to want to have a say on how that $35 million is going to be spent. Now, I don't know how he's going to feel about Robert Sala. Maybe he won't care. Maybe because Robert Sala is a defensive guy, if Joe Douglas wanted to fire him at the end of the season, and you know, then maybe Rodgers would be okay with that. Uh, but, the, the, but I got to tell you one thing, uh, and this wouldn't even be fault of Aaron Rodgers. You think Aaron Rodgers wants to come back at the age of 40, coming back from an Achilles injury, and see the team blown up around him? New coach, new general manager, new personnel? Remember, he said he came here because he liked the Jets. He liked Robert Sala. He liked their talent. Now, maybe he just said that because there was no place else for him to go. But if he meant that and he believed that, well, then how the heck, if you're Woody Johnson, do you blow it up? Because Aaron Rodgers is already in the Hall of Fame. So he could turn around and go, all right, we gave it a try with the Jets. Didn't work out. I'm just going to retire. Or I'm not going to play for you. Uh, trade me someplace else. So... I understand that Joe's old school and he doesn't want the players to act as the general manager and all that. But unfortunately, it's the way it works when you put so much of an investment into one player and he committed to you financially and you committed to him, you're in a marriage. And I don't know how your marriage works, but my marriage works where you got to run it by each other when you do something like that. So I do not think there's any way, shape, or form that you're going to see the Jets blow this up as much as Joe Namath wants to see that happen. 1-800-919-3776 is the number to call. I want to hear from you. And then at 6 o'clock, we've got Anthony Pusick with an ENN. And you know when Anthony does an ENN, it's something to stay in tune for. And it is going to be a televised vehicle. It's the K-Show. It's all happening on Yes and right here on 98.7 ESPN New York. Your attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Yes. Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's time for the Dan Orlovsky Report, brought to you oh. by Sansone Auto Mall. You kidding me? Auto Mall, 10 top brands, over 2,000 vehicles, one place, Sansone Auto Mall in Woodbridge. Hi, Dan. What's up, guys? How are we doing? We're doing great. We're doing great. You intrigued me by the comment you made on McAfee that you have heard that this could be it for Belichick. So we started the show talking about where he could land. He, he has said that he's always wanted to coach the Giants. Cowboy job might be open. Chargers job might be open. Uh, Washington job is probably going to be open. If you were Bill Belichick and you wanted to win a championship, which one would you pick? And if you wanted to win a lot of games, which one would you pick? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's this hypothetical of, you know, what jobs potentially could become open. I would say this. What, who's got the best roster and the young quarterback or the best quarterback? You know, like, realistically, if, He's coming off of a place in New England, and we could say whatever we want, but they were really talented in New England for a long time. It wasn't just Tom Brady by himself. So, so what team has got the best roster of talent, and then what team does he think has the best quarterback, or you know, is he going to have the number one pick or something? So I don't like if, if I look at those teams that you just rattled off. Okay, so you said Chargers, you said Giants, you said Cowboys, Cowboys, Washington, and then was there a fifth? Um, that was a four. That was that four. I mean, if you're just blindly looking at those rosters and then the quarterback, you'd probably say Dallas. Um, 
because that's the most talented football team out of those four and has the best quarterback when it comes to with the supply of talent on the roster. So um, I just think this, like, I, I know that's become a big thing. I guess I'm not all surprised to know or to hear um, that a coach of a team that hasn't been good three out of the last four years and now is contending to be the number one pick of the draft, you know, has the chance to not be the coach there next year. I, I'm, I'm all, not all that surprised by that. Now, the, I, I think the Cowboys are the easy answer just because of the fact that they, I think they seem the closest of the teams that we mentioned. And it seems a little bit more realistic that Jerry, at least in the interim, will leave some power for Bill. The other teams already have general managers in place. So, and, and also Bill Barcells had said to Belichick that Jerry's great to work for. So it just seems like Dallas to me would be the easy answer. Yeah, I mean, it's also, what happens if Dallas goes to the divisional round this year? What happens if they go to the NFC Championship game this year? You know, it, obviously there's a big jump ahead right now in what ifs, but I, Dallas is a really good team and probably top three, top four in the NFC. So are they going to move on from McCarthy if they get to the NFC title? Or even if they get back to the divisional round, are they just saying, hey, Bill Belichick is, is the difference? And then, you know, is he not in New England? Would he want to go there? So that's obviously it's a bunch of what ifs. All right, let's, let's talk about team meetings. So Garrett Wilson was on with Barton Hahn yesterday and said that they had a team meeting for the Jets. You've been there, done that. Do those work? Uh, I'm not really. You know, I, I've been in a team meeting led by the coach that, you know, kind of happened midseason, and we weren't playing well, and the coach um, that had this meeting, and this was – an abnormal team meeting. This wasn't like the regular scheduled team meeting that you have on almost on a daily basis. Laid out exactly what we weren't doing and how to fix it. And if we fixed it, what the likelihood of you know the next eight games was going to be. And but I, I you know most of the player-led only player-only team meetings that I've been a part of usually don't have a ton of impact. All right, Buffalo is leaving the door open. For the, for the Jets to, to win this game coming up on Sunday and, and still staying alive. Are, are they capable in your mind for a team that hasn't scored a touchdown in forever? Are the Jets capable of taking advantage of this opportunity? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, their, their defense is the nemesis of Josh Allen's, and there's a lot of chaos going on in Buffalo and noise going on in Buffalo. And so it sets up well for them, at least in that matchup, to take advantage of it. And, you know, Buffalo's defense is, I mean, played really good the other night versus Denver, but they're depleted. I mean, they are dealing with a ton of injuries. So, um, you know, the Jets' offense hasn't been good, but they've been bad. And, some of the most critical areas, which is red zone and, you know, third down situations and um, offensive line injuries have started to reveal themselves even more, even more. So it's, it's going to be one of those games where if Josh Allen doesn't have, you know, a silly interception uh, and they don't have careless, carelessness with the football in Buffalo, it's a tall task for the Jets. But if they can get him to kind of play the way that he does against them, it feels like they absolutely have a shot. Well, do you? I mean, you know the guy. You know you've seen him play. Is Trevor Simeon so bad that they don't think that he'd be a viable option other than Zach Wilson? Um, no. I mean, Trevor's been around for a long time. I just don't think that Trevor Simeon is going to. You know, turn this offense over on itself and make it something that it's just not. I, I don't, I don't see that happening. Zach actually played competent football on Sunday night. Obviously, the interception is a, you know, a backbreaker and poor decision and late with his eyes and all that. But I don't, I, I think everyone in that building realistically sits there and says the offense is what it is, both talent and scheme. So. Um, I don't know if Trevor's going to flip that on its head. Should they have changed the scheme after the four plays? Obviously not in that first game, but should they have 
fit the scheme around Zach Wilson's skill set rather than Aaron Rodgers? I said that the day it happened, Michael. I, I, and what I said was they should go back to what the Giants did last year with Daniel Jones. And what they did with Daniel Jones was five, six times a game, they utilized them in the way that Philadelphia uses a Jalen Hurts. Here comes quarterback runner, zone read, so allowed his athleticism to be a significantly bigger part of the conversation. Um, they committed to protecting him. They went heavy play action. I mean, the Giants literally would run play action 15 times a game last year. And it worked. And uh, the Jets haven't done that. So their, their scheme is what it is right now. Uh, I don't think it's going to change. But I do think that those were two things that should have been implemented in that just weren't. So what, what do I take from the Giants the rest of the way? Can they win another game? Are they destined to go 2-15? and 15? How is this going to look? We've got half a season left to play, and it's been a disaster. Yeah. Wouldn't you hope for them to go 2-15, and 15, though, realistically? But, but, I mean, does... Is 2-15 that different than 5-12? and 12? Right, but, but let me, let me, right, Let's have that conversation because I think it's a really interesting one. Yes, I'd rather get the pick and, ha and change the quarterback. But you don't do these things in a vacuum. I've got a coach that's, that's trying to win games. I've got players, yeah, yeah. pretty good players, that are trying to do well. If they go 2-15, and 15, I feel like we've got problems that go beyond our quarterback. So as much as I want to get the highest pick... I also want to know that I've got competent players and a coach to build around, and at 2-15, and 15, I'm not going to be sure about that. Yeah, so, like me, the player, I would, I would tell you, go F yourself and you're nuts and I want to <laughs> win every game. I, that's not where I am in my life right now. So it's easy, obviously, for me to say get to 2-15. Guys, I was on 0-16, 0-11, and 0-9. And and so I, I, I know what it's like. It's awful. Um the truth is what happens one year, specifically when it comes to like losing or having a bad season, doesn't really impact that much of the next season. It really does. If there's a conversation of, oh, end the year the right way, oh, I, you just you want to go and compete. Um, but, listen, I hope they do nothing with Brian Dable. I'm a Brian Dable fan. Uh, I think he's a really good head coach, and I think he really understands football. Obviously, this year has gone poorly. But if you're a Giants fan, and you're someone who's looking at the long term, the best thing that can happen is for you to get one of those first two picks. That's the truth. It's not fun to say. It's not fair to say the players or the coaches. But my job isn't attached to that. My job is telling the truth about what's best, and that is. One of the things that we've talked about today, and I'll get your take. If the Jets have hit the skids and they don't win any more games and it's mid-December and Aaron Rodgers is ready to roll, should he be out there? Well, think Dan, about, take your time and think about it, Dan. Did we lose Dan? Yeah. I, I, oh, give him a moment. He's, this is a deep question that you asked. Tough question. Yeah, should he come back? What does should mean, really? All right, Dan, you're there? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, yes, all right, sir. So, so your question uh, was if, 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 if they hit a skid, if the Jets, if Jets don't win a game the rest of the way, and it's mid-December and Rodgers is good, he says he's ready to go, can you make a case that he shouldn't play? Oh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't play. I wouldn't play him if I were the Jets. If we're, if we're out of it and we haven't played good football and obviously we're beat up still and can't protect the quarterback, even though he's, you know, fought his absolute tail off and whatnot, no, 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 that, that's when in one of those situations, I think the owner has to step in and be like, hey, like we, we, we've got much bigger fish to fry in the next year. But don't you, I mean, don't you get the sense, Dan, and we're talking with Dan Orlovsky, his weekly spot on the show, that Rodgers being is built around getting back and defying the odds. And then if you don't allow him to, I think he's running the team, too. I mean, I still think he's going to play, even if there's nothing to play for. They could say everything that you're saying, but he's going to say, I want to play. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I would do everything I could if that was the case and not get him on the field. You know, they can medically clear him. Aaron, you did the unthinkable, but 
I, I would imagine that that organization and that owner would realize the risk would no longer be worth the reward and it's time to move forward to 2024. I get that he might want to play. Um, I don't have checks that big that I cut, so I would imagine Mr. Johnson uh, would certainly have a, a voice in that. Now, again, the circumstances are not the same, and I'm not advocating for Dable to be fired, mind you. But you mentioned the three seasons in which you were on bad teams, the 0-16 um, Lions team, the 2-14 and Colt team, and then the 4-12 and Buccaneer team. Those are the three you were talking about, right? All, all three coaches yes, lost their job at the end of the year. Like, so, And again, I know the circumstances are different, and their tenures were not as long, but it's difficult to survive when your team is that bad. Yeah, so my 0-16 Colt or 0-16 Lions year, you know, that was the third year of the guys' tenure. They also were getting the number one pick, so that mattered because they needed a new quarterback. Um, the Colts year, I don't know if they fired Coach Caldwell. I don't know. They might have. I don't remember. They did. Um, uh, well, yeah, he they, did, he came yeah. back in 20. He, he came back later, but um, that uh, was a team that was really cool. Chuck Pagano, I think, um, took over the next year. Yeah, again, they were taking Andrew Luck. Mm -hmm. And then the Bucks year was the second year with Greg Schiano. Right. Um, that was, they, there was never, you know, much, much, I don't think on the field. I get it, I get it. Like, you, you go through that year and it's hard. But I, I, I think Brian Dable is well, way too thought highly of, or way too highly thought of and well respected and accomplished from last year. That's what I would, point with me. Good stuff, Dan. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. You too, guys. That's a Dan Orlovsky report brought to you by Sansone Auto Mall. Make your best deal right now at Sansone Auto Mall and tell them Bart Scott sent you and take an extra $1,000 off your best deal. Call 1 800 Sansone today. Now we'll come back. We find out who the point god is. It's, I think it's way up in the air today. I don't think anybody really, like, sees control of it early. Uh, I, I can see it being a caller today. Or, of course, this is on the table. You have to think about this. I don't want to be with a chicken. Yeah. Don said a lot of powerful things during the show. <laughs> Very you know I, mean? I think he's going to be. Uh, I, I, I don't want to kill. He's going to be at the beginning of ENN quite a bit. <laughs> that, too. And also, I, I think today has required that there's a new intro to Would You Wednesday. To this, yeah. So yeah. many things were said today that are no the question. essence of Would You Wednesday. So it was a good Would You Wednesday. Uh, maybe the best you've ever had. Hey, to score a touchdown, everything needs to line up perfectly. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. Snoop Dogg uh, announced today he will no longer smoke. He's giving what? up smoking. Holy crap. Is that is that why he's, like, trending? Yeah. There's all yes. this stuff? Yeah. Yes, he's not. Now, th is there's still not... gummies out there. I still think he's going to Wait, get did, he ha did something happen? I don't know. He said he spoke with his family and decided that he's not going to smoke anymore. He's giving up smoking. Didn't say he's giving up smoking pot. He said po no, smoking no, 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 no. Per uh, in general. That's no, all he means. But I, no, I think he's given up smoking pot, too, because there's other ways yeah, that, no, he doesn't to smoke. partake without smoking. Snoop doesn't smoke cigarettes. That would, this would be yeah, only be a pot thing. Yeah, God, and, you're and, such and a square man. You know, that's something that does get lost is you're still smoking. Oh, that's always you know, lost. Uh, yeah, always Weed lost. Pot heads, filtered, pot too. Head, exactly. Potheads <laughs> act like it's the worst, too, because, like, I, I, if, if I was forced to choose, I was only going to be... Someone said you can smoke something and you'll have no health risk from it. Smoke one thing the rest of your life. I would choose cigarettes. I enjoy it more than pot. And if you ever end up in a situation where you're smoking a cigarette and there's someone who smokes weed there, the judgment they give, as if the, the weed that they're smoking is actually increasing their health. Right. They, they look at it like eating a salad. Well, let, let, you know who knows a lot about this? The, yeah, our next guest. Jeff yeah. But I, I would tell you, just, you know, sometimes you could look at somebody and read a book by its cover, just like me. He has never smoked, he has never partaken in marijuana. He, oh, is, he is a pure bread. No. That's what he is. No just way. like me. Jeff, am I right? Jeff Passon no. joins us. All I'm going to say is, uh, in the context of... Oh, no, oh. you're breaking up. This is, this is the worst line Jeff's ever had. Yeah, Jeff, come on. You're better than this. No. All right, Holly's back. He's there back. He's back. All, all you're going to say is... I, I was going to say, Snoop Dogg did not say he is giving up smoking. He said he is giving up smoke. Now, what that means, oh. if, if my translator is correct, is he's giving up weed, period. 
which it, it, it just seems wrong. Like, <laughs> I love this day. Weed is peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> yeah, so, his so brand true. is about like weed. So how could he be giving that up? He's, he's, he's beyond a brand. He doesn't yeah. need I mean, he's, weed. Needs Snoop at this point more than <laughs> Snoop needs weed. <laughs> wow. Okay. Like <laughs> Snoop's gonna be just fine. But I just it's an unbelievable. Like I have to tell you, I, I'm fortunate enough in my life. And don't worry, Michael. I wouldn't waste this precious time if I if I didn't know Jeff well enough to know he'd enjoy hearing this. I've been I've been blessed enough in my cool hip hop life to have been in many a smoking situation with Snoop. He lives the brand so authentically. Like, it's like you've stepped out of reality and into a movie where there's Snoop Dogg, blunt after right. blunt after blunt. So it you, never you, ends. You, all of a sudden, you step into Pineapple, pineapple, pineapple Express. Pineapple right? Express, or, yeah, or, or whatever. It's always... So it is going to be fascinating to see him all of a sudden. There won't... You know, like, stadiums would break the rules for Snoop. Like, Snoop would go to a, a baseball game, a basketball game, a football game, they find places for him to smoke weed before that was a thing. It's it's bizarre. <laughs> him and Willie Nelson. Him and Willie yes. Nelson got that treatment of like, hey, we know there's no smoking here, but you're Snoop Dogg. You're Willie Nelson. Wow. You're Jeff. You're Jeff Passan. You happy you got all that I info? I want to know the story of what caused. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm genuinely curious what caused him to to give it up because the, it's it's synonymous. I mean. I, I, I would venture to say Snoop's probably been more high than he's been sober, right, oh, Peter? A hundred percent. And uh, by the way, though, if we're looking for a little conspiracy theory here, he, I will say next week is the anniversary, 30 years of Snoop's iconic Doggy Style album. So maybe it's all part of sort of a big press blitz for the, you know, for is the that dog. Where Gin and Juice came from. That's right. All right. Wow. Now, one thing that Jeff Passon's synonymous with is knowing smoking weed. about baseball. Not oh, smoking baseball. weed. No, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. But, but, uh, but honestly, I'm going to just... say two things. Uh, smoking weed or lawn accidents. Third, baseball. Oh, he, that's too soon, Jeff. <laughs> See, he's good. Jeff. Okay. I, uh, listen, if, if, if you can't laugh about being... What are you laughing about? Thank you. I mean, Jeff, Jeff made jokes about a serious accident faster than I've seen anyone ever do it in history, and I never respected him more. Jeff, where is Otani going? I mean, do we really even know, or is everybody just guessing? No, let's just get the, let, let, let's Anthony, get the line better. Anthony, we, we've got to have a better line. Jeff Passon cannot be compromised this way. It can't be. I won't allow you it. You might be driving no. on some Kansas City interstate. You, uh, you know, I mean, listen, if Dan Orlovsky craps out two, three times call, that's one thing. Jeff Passan, it's, it's unacceptable. Can't have it. Can't have it. Won't have it. No, it won't Refuse have it. There's have certain it. people and, and that are sacred. You know, there, there's, there was uh, Steve Young, God rest his soul. Oh, what? What's wrong I'm, with you? Sorry, his, uh, his, K, his K show soul. And Jeff Passan. Um, there are a couple. Any other names that you'd put in the absolute iconic Hall of Fame? Griffin. <laughs> that's not, no, that's but, not true. Now, but before he comes back, I love Griffin, but you wouldn't let him. You, you let Griffin stay on hold for two hours. You wouldn't do that to Steve. Clearly, you want with the we won't get into it with him when we get him back on the line because we've moved on. But in this respite here, he smoked before. Oh yeah, he's not yeah. Michael. That Michael, Michael totally misread made that, that situation. Totally misread. Oh, so you you actually look at it as a, a pejorative term toward me that I haven't smoked. You, you don't look at it and say, wow, that's pretty honorable that he never did something that until recently was no, illegal. No, I'm judging you judging someone else right. that they're like that. Yeah, no, we're, I think it's impressive in no, some weird way. No, good for you, Michael, and how you live, but you, you looked at Jeff and then just took the made the assumption that he is somebody that shares He's your like view you. on that. Right. And it doesn't sound like he completely but does. If, I mean, the you, guy, if you look at Jeff, he looks like see, one of the characters in Toy Story. He's not smoking pot. Oh, you yeah, never I, judge a book by yes, its Yes, I do that all the time. Yeah, that's that's the lesson you're teaching the, the, the children. Jeff is back. All right, good. Jeff, I'm sorry that this has gone off the rails on your phone and you're not paying your bills. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, I, I am in the, the hotel where the owner's meetings were. Uh, so... Uh, if if you want to blame the fancy hotel, go for that. But uh, yes, my phone bill is fully paid, so I think we're going to be okay. All right. Again. So where is Otani going, or are we just guessing and trying to read tea leaves? Because it looks like he's got a very tight circle. Uh, it is an extremely tight circle, and if I were to venture a guess at this point, uh, it, I don't have any confidence that it would be accurate because. The thing about Shohei Itani, and this this is like a fascinating part to me, he's been in Major League Baseball for six years now, 
and we really don't know anything about him. We don't know what he wants. We don't know what he desires. We don't know what's important to him. We don't know if it's a coast. We don't know if it's wet. We just not know what it is. Maybe it's money. I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that there's only a finite number of teams that are capable of paying him what he is going to want to and what he deserves to get paid. And that includes uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Texas Rangers and the Boston Red Sox and the Chicago Cubs and the New York Mets and the San Francisco Giants and maybe the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, it, it's not a whole lot beyond that, though. Um, and, and I don't think it's going to be the Yankees, which I, I don't know. I, I find that to be very interesting because this is a once-in-a-lifetime player that we're talking about. And if the consequences of the Yankees' poor moves that got them where they are right now are that financially they don't feel like they're in a position to go out and get the biggest star on the planet in baseball, I, I mean, that to me is, is as damning a thing as anything about what they've done lately because, frankly, Shohei Otani, in your mind's eye, should be in pinstripe, should he not? He's the type of player who I think historically would be the one that the Yankees would be unequivocally, unquestionably targeting in free agency. But if they would get him, Jeff, I know this sounds like it's a ridiculous statement, but they, he would not, he, unless he plays a position, as long as they have Stanton, where, where are you going to put him? You're going to release Stanton? So you put the $98 million on top of what you're spending for Otani? Yeah, I, listen, I understand. It's, it's a reasonable point, but this goes back to you know, the consequences of, of actions that uh, are unfortunate. And this is one of those where uh, it, I think it's not unfair for Yankees fans to wonder, is, is there any amount of money that could be eaten potentially on Stanton that uh, would allow you to go out and get Otani and put him in that position? Uh, I, I don't, the, answer's, uh, the answer's obviously no, because they're, they're not really involved in it. Do you think his comments about Stanton as accurate as they were, were done to try to get him the way if there's no trade clause? And if not, what was the logic behind it? Um, I don't know that there was a whole lot of logic behind it. I mean, I, I think Brian Cashman was just uh, in a truth-telling mode that day. And he felt like he had to get a lot off his chest. And... I, I think some of what he said was reasonable and fair. I think some of what he said uh, was not correct. But more than anything, what I appreciated about him that day was that it felt like he was sticking up for his people. And that is what good leaders do. They, they stick up for their people even when they know that their people uh, may not be right or haven't been at their best. And I think Brian Cashman was uh, the flak jacket that day for for what the New York Yankees have turned into in recent years, and yes, I understand. Two years ago it was a it was a, you know a, a good team, a playoff team, a team that got beaten by a much better team in the ALCS. But last year, everyone in the Yankees organization agreed. Last year was an unmitigated disaster, and the scary part is that unless they do some real tinkering this offseason. I don't know that next year looks a whole lot better. Now, I, I run the chance of getting jumped by you here, but, like, I look at Soto and I look at Otani. And I remember a story mm -hmm. you wrote, maybe it was last year, about how Soto is Ted Williams in his first five years. And he's 25 years yep. old and Otani's 30. I'd rather have Soto. Yep. How about you? I don't blame you. Um, no, I would not. I would rather have Otani, but I totally understand uh, your perspective, and I think there's an argument to be made that that's the case because of his age and because the production's been fantastic and because he plays a position uh, in the corner outfield spots that the Yankees could desperately use and because he's a left-handed batter. And a big part of me wonders if that's not part of the calculus for the Yankees' approach this winter that if they're going to spend 400 plus million dollars on a guy uh, that they would prefer it to be Juan Soto. Uh, I, I totally get that. I just think that Otani, when he is at his, not even at his apex, Michael, 
just when he's healthy, is the best player in baseball. And and yet we've seen offensive advancements from him over the last few years in particular that have been staggering. I mean, he is a much better hitter than he was, uh, not just when he came here, but in recent seasons. And I have faith that he's going to come back and going to be a starting pitcher. I don't know if he's going to be one of the best starting pitchers in the big leagues, but I have a hard time thinking that this guy who's gone out there after Tommy John surgery previously and found the success he did is not going to at least be similar. And if somebody has a little bit of velocity to lose or a little bit of movement to lose on his pitches, it's Otani. I think even 90% of what he's been in recent years on the mound is still an all-star caliber pitcher. I don't remember the Yankees and the Mets both being after the big name free agent at the same time. Yamamoto might end up being that guy. How intriguing mm-hmm. is that to you, and, and, and who wins that face-off if it comes down to just those two? I don't know that it's going to come down to just those two. Okay. Here's, here's how I think it's, it's going to play out. He's going to get posted sometime soon. You know, the, the expectation is that it's going to be this week, it may be next week. Either way, uh, over the two weeks or so after that, I think there's going to be a whittling of teams. And the Yankees and Mets, I do believe, are going to be among – that final group with the Dodgers and the Red Sox and the Cubs. Like, it's it's unbelievable how many teams are frothing for Yoshinobu Yamamoto. And, and, and it goes back, Michael, the, the salient point you made about Juan Soto's age being an X factor. That's the case with Yamamoto. You just do not find ace-level pitchers on the free agent market at 25 years old. I mean, we're looking at the guys this, you know, this winter who are going to get paid. Blake Snell, 30. Aaron Nola, 30. Um, you know, Jordan Montgomery, 30. Like, this is five years of your prime career that you're talking before a guy gen- generally hits free agency. And so as much as the stuff is really good and, and the fastball sits 95 to 96, runs up to 99, uh, and the splitter is like sang to good, and the curveball, you know, he might come in with the best right-handed curveball in baseball, and he throws a cutter and a slide or two. Like five legitimately good major league pitches, plus he's 25 years old. I mean, we're talking someone who's going to get in excess of $200 million, and considering the teams that are interested in him, I think it's going to be even higher than that. And what that, to me, is going to come down to is who's willing to pay. And I, I'm not going to say that the New York Mets are going to win bidding for Yoshinobu Yamamoto. What I will say is that we've established pretty well over the last few years that there's nobody out there willing to pay like Steve Cohen is. And if he wants someone, he usually gets them. So with Jeff Passan, our very own, right here on the Michael K Show, 9870 ESPN. Um, what becomes of the San Diego Padres? You know, Peter Seidler, who's been ill for a while, passes away at the age of 63. There were reports that they borrowed $50 million in September to make payroll. I always said yep. that when he was spending yep. all this money, Jeff, he was outspending that market. I didn't know how he was going to generate that, but he wanted to win a championship. Does, that, does it now get all broken up? Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the organization handles it now because I, I think Peter Seidler was the driver behind all of that. And I think he was, you know, in the end, I, I, I love people like this. He was a believer. He, he believed in the idea of if you build it, they will come. And even as the Padres struggled last year, they still went over 3 million in attendance. They still had fan engagement that was – you know, uh, at the top level of the sport and an excitement that for years just did not exist in San Diego. And to me that, you know, on the day that the Oakland A's move away from Oakland after 55 years and, and go to Las Vegas, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting that John Fisher chooses to do that uh, and, and that you juxtapose that with Peter Seidler's death and you're looking at someone who's considered the best owner in baseball versus someone who's considered the worst owner in baseball and just how those how the fortunes of the franchise so often depend on the steward 
I'm the person who is willing to commit the most in resources and energy and love to that team and to those fans. And, and replicating that, whoever takes over ultimately as a control person, um, you know, the, the Padres appointed Mitts are one, one of Sizer's uh, business partners, but whoever takes over ultimately, it's going to be really difficult to match what Peter Seidler did because he had a dream of bringing a championship to San Diego for the first time, and he was willing to go out there and lose money doing it. And now the, the interesting part of this, Michael, is when we look at their payroll, um, they're $191 million estimated right now with arbitration salaries. And they've lost almost 700 innings of pitching in free agency. Uh, filling 700 innings is going to take a large chunk of change. And with Manny Machado, Xander Bogarts, Fernando Tatis Jr., El Musgrove, and Hugh Darvish, all the full no trade co- uh, clauses, uh, with Jake Cronenworth's contract relatively unmovable and without a whole lot on the books otherwise that they can get rid of, logically what it says to you is that Juan Soto has to go. If you want to payroll at $200 million, as uh, the Padres would like to do for next season, uh, Juan Soto simply can't be a part of it, and that, that is why Yankee fans should be excited because I think they've got a really good chance of going out and getting him. Now, I really like what you said about Seidler, and it is a sad story. But isn't it even sad, too, that here's a small market team that's been in existence for over 50 years that has mm-hmm. to spend beyond its means in order to be able to get fans and to become relevant to end up crippling the franchise after the fact? Even if they had won the championship, Jeff, it would have been a Marlins situation, right, where you'd have to break it down just to build it back up again and spend an inordinate amount of money to do so. I mean, isn't that a shame, too, that the only way the Padres can make it work is to have an owner that is going to throw just a ton of money at the problem? You know, it's not the only way to make it work. Um, I mean, let's... You know, I think a really interesting case in the coming years is going to be the Baltimore Orioles, right? Because they are not going out and spending like a big market team, but they sure are winning like a good team. I mean, 101 wins last year in the AL East, and they're just getting started. And so a big part of me wonders, is winning enough? It should be, right? But it isn't in Tampa. It hasn't been in Cleveland. Like, there have been places where organizations have won and they still haven't filled the ballpark. And so at that point, I, you know, it makes me wonder about the baseball fan and what he or she wants and desires. Is it winning more than anything? Or is it excitement? And, and this idea that in San Diego, especially a city that, again, only has now one professional sports team, um, that there's some sort of community at the ballpark every time you go. It's what, it's what always strikes me about Yankee Stadium every time I go there. And and I appreciate, you know, the, the fact that if you go out and sit in right field uh, in the bleachers, I mean, it feels like a, a group of people who, even if they don't know each other, feel like they've known each other forever. And it's it's why, to me, the, the Yankees are the institution that they are and, and why I think, conversely, uh, the fans have been so aggrieved and disappointed and saddened by the last 15 years not winning a championship because the expectations there are not just that you have the community, but that winning is part of it, too. We have about a minute, but this is a complicated question. I'm sure that you could parse it down. So I read today, you know, there's trouble with the, the, the Bally Sports and Sinclair RSNs, but yep. they, they, they're not going to pick up the money they owe Cleveland and Texas. Cleveland's $55 million. Texas is 110 Jeff, that's a significant chunk of money taken out of it. I don't know if those two teams can come up with another source of that kind of income. What What's baseball going to do? It's a great question, Michael. I, mean, I, I think it's one that uh, was probably more the focus of these owners' meetings than even the Oakland A's moving to Las Vegas because this is an existential threat to Major League Baseball financially. You know, for a long long time, the stadium boom was what was uh, putting money into owners' coffers. But then it became local television revenue. And when you have a disparity as great in local television dollars 
as exists right now. And that disparity, uh, you know, among the Dodgers, Yankees, and other big market teams versus some of the smaller market teams only is growing. Um, yeah, there there is a reckoning that's coming, and I don't know what it's going to look like. I hope it's not as dire or as bad as I think it is, um, but it's going to change the sport. Jeff, we love you. You know that. Uh, you know what? In my opinion, has not changed, despite the fact that you kind of hinted at you did partake in the bubons every now and then. You didn't say it, but you hinted at it. I still love you. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> what kind of bizarre of world is this? this? <laughs> yeah, you know no what? Bow down and, to him. Well, yeah, you, you, you know what? Care about his I opinion. love you. I love you because of the boobons. I, I, I listen. I just love you. I don't care what you do. Yeah, smoke. I just don't enjoy smoke. your company. How about that? I was just, a, you know, I was just gonna walk off with like a smoke weed every day. <laughs> Michael doesn't know what you're talking about, Jeff, but he right. appreciates it. I think I appreciate everything Jeff says. Uh, I know you. I know you appreciate. Oh, I sure Peter. do. I, I sure do. Jeff, I know you're gonna be busy. Oh my God. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, you and yes. your family. Uh, thank you. You guys do the same, and I uh, hope you uh, hope you enjoy your little talk tonight, Michael. Take care. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> Yeah, that's not happening. Uh, we have a Monty Tumor next. Yeah, but first, Peter's going to tell us who's splashing around in his bathtub. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching. Yes. Oh, man. Shout out if you missed it. Shout out to our guy, Jeff Puff Puff Passin. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, by the way, that's his new name from now puff, on. Puff, 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 passing. Because I don't know if you know the, the the term, Michael. What I'm saying here, but it's puff, puff, I think and you can put it together. You think so? Yeah, yeah. I, I, but you, you know what? I'm not the brightest light in the chandelier, but I do shine. <laughs> puff, puff, passing. Time now for the Amani Tumor Report, brought to you by go. the New York Structural Steel Painting Contractors Association. And Tough act to follow here. Big low T, and we bring in our Super Bowl champion. Amani there, too. I mean, that helps. That helps. That does help. Right away, he's got a leg up on passing. Passing never won anything. Anyway, how you doing, Amani? Oh, I'm doing great. Puff, puff, passing. I like that. I like it. <laughs> yeah. well, I'll come up with By the time we get off the phone, Amani, I'm going to have got, one for I you. Mean, if he partakes in it, Peter, how about token tumor? <laughs> oh. I mean, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm getting I'm getting a license in Newark, so we're gonna have a uh, oh really? Uh, uh, yeah, we're gonna have a, a dispensary in Newark that's going oh. to be able to provide the finest quality puff puff passing in Newark. Well, who <laughs> who knew? I back to back guess. I love yeah. it. This is unbelievable. How about how about how about how about pass the boom tumor? <laughs> Or I got it. Okay, we can workshop that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we'll we're gonna figure it out. Tomb. Yeah, lower the boom tomb. I think, you know? I think token tumor is <laughs> nice and simple, alliterative. I like that. Anyway, let's get to some football. There's a All segment right. of people that follow the Giants and like the Giants that say mm -hmm. if you get the first or second pick, it's smarter to take Marvin Harrison the third rather than take one of the quarterbacks and roll with Daniel Jones. What would you do, Imani? Ooh, I feel like, you know, it's, it's a hard question because as being a receiver, I got to kind of take the, you know, the love of the position and just kind of take a step out of it. Okay. But you don't grow a team through the wide receivers. Receivers are luxury people. They're, you have everything in place, and the, the cherry on top, the icing on top of the cake is a wide receiver. You can't build a team with the receiver because you need an offensive line, you need a quarterback, you need an offensive scheme. All this stuff has to happen and be in place for a wide receiver to thrive. You put a wide receiver in a bad situation, and it's, he's not going to be able to show what he can do. So I would definitely go with the best player on the board. If that so happens to be a quarterback, so be it. But you have to get one of these players that's going to change your franchise forever. And uh, that's what the first pick is. That's what the second pick mm -hmm. is. I'm talking about a guy who's going to be a Hall of Famer and um, whatever position that is. But I think the, one of the least important positions in building a team 
uh, is a wide receiver, and it even hurts me to say that because you know I was. Well, well, let me let me just double up before the the guys jump in. In your opinion, is Harrison as great? Mm -hmm. I know you're a Michigan guy. He's Ohio State. Is he as great as people mm -hmm. say? You know, I haven't really watched him that uh, intently. Mm -hmm. I've watched a few of his highlights. Um, I, there's certain things that I look for in wide receivers. You know, I see him beat zone. I've seen. I want to see him man to man, and I want to see how he manipulates wide receivers. I, I manipulate defensive backs. I want to see how he creates a separation off the press. And I'm not saying he can't do it, but but I haven't seen it. So I've I've seen him. You know, catch deep balls. But if you're play, catching deep balls versus guys that are, you know, that are uh, redshirt sophomores trying to, you know, still homesick from their mom, that's not the same what you're going to get in the NFL. So I, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't studied it yet. So I want to with I want to mm. withhold my judgment uh, on, on Marvin Harrison Jr. But if there's anything like his dad, he's gonna he, right. he's got a he, he's got a bright future. Now, if you believe in Daniel Jones and you don't want to take a quarterback with the first or second pick do you look as you said you wouldn't take a wide receiver would you look another position or would you look to trade and try to get a bunch of picks back I would look for a player that is going to change my franchise forever I'm looking for an LT I'm looking for a straight hand I'm looking for you know Eli May I'm looking for somebody who I'm going to get the most bang for my buck and a position, I, I don't care. I know everybody knows a lot about the quarterbacks, and if it's a quarterback, so be it. I mean, Daniel Jones had a great year last year, uh, but when you look at what you're actually dealing with, you're dealing with a quarterback that is uh, often injured, has uh, uh, two neck injuries that he's missed a substantial amount of time. He played great last year. I'm not saying anything about that, but you, if you think he's going to be around for the next, 10, 15 years uh, with a neck injury that kept him out uh, for a substantial amount of time in two separate seasons, I, I don't know. And, and this, this is how these types of quarterbacks move. I remember Kerry Collins, uh, he hurt his ankle, missed a substantial amount of time, we ended up going four and uh, uh, four in uh, what, what, no, we four, won and four games and we yeah. lost four, yeah, four and 12. Thanks for the math. I, you know. <laughs> anyway, so four and 12. <laughs> Four and twelve, uh, and that's when they drafted Eli. It's, it's one of these positions where if you are in the top two, ten or top five, you're just setting yourself up for getting the best quarterback in the draft for the next season. Um, Michael and I have been arguing a bit uh, this week, Amani. I, I am I am a Commanders fan. Um, I have no concern this week. My normal concern that I have for the Giants, which is always high because you guys generally own us, does not exist this week. And I think and the was, Giants win. And he thinks they win outright. I, I, I need you to weigh in. We know you're very positive. You're a glass half full guy. Vegas has the commanders who are four and six as ten point favorites at home. How do you feel about this this Sunday? Oh, I, I I'm not feeling good if you're a Giants fan. <laughs> I, I'm not feeling good at all. Um, Tommy DeVito at quarterback is is uh, you know it's a great story, but. Great stories go to die on the field. <laughs> when they actually have to go out mm -hmm. there and perform, that's where these great stories go to die. I feel for Tommy DeVito because he could probably you know, been around the team for a couple years, learned how he learned what it's like to be a quarterback without without getting exposed. He's getting exposed. He, he's not ready, and I don't know if he's ever going to be able to re to get back some of his. You know some of the hype that 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 that, he, that surrounded him during the preseason. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't see this team scoring enough points. I don't see this defense keeping um, you know the Commanders out. Um, I, I just feel like the Commanders have such a advantage uh, on, on on the Giants that I'm not looking forward to doing this post game show on MSG. Um, this Sunday. You'll see. Well, Michael, You'll you, see. Michael, you clearly know the best, though. You'll see. You'll see. You'll both see. You're both negative people. But you, again, you still won't bet it, though. I, I, I'll bet you. I said I bet you for five bucks. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought we were going to talk about. I thought we were going to talk about the Terps. Listen, we can, I don't, I'm not as confident in the Terps this weekend as I am the Commanders. I'm not not as. Now, if you talked to me a month ago 
when we were an undefeated, you know, 5-0 and o Terps, I was feeling pretty good. Not feeling as good right okay. now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because, uh, you know, we have some problems over at Michigan, you know, with uh, with Terp, Terp Harbaugh trying to, uh, Yeah, there's you know, some distractions. Little... There's some distractions there. Yeah, yeah. You know, the old football saying is if you're not cheating, you're not really trying. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we try hard at Michigan, I guess. Uh, let's see, the line there, in case you're wondering now, Amani, if we want to have a bet in our, in our situation, you guys are 19-point okay. favorites in College Park. Oh, I take that. You take the oh, 19. Wow. I would take 19. Did you see what Michigan did last week? They didn't even throw. They didn't throw the ball once in the second half, and just said, "Penn State, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat this. We're just going to run it right down your throat, and we're going to tell you where we're going to run it. Come and stop us." And they just couldn't do it. You think? They couldn't belly up. Maybe they had. Maybe they had Penn State signs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sign of. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they just ran right through them. All signs didn't matter. We were telling you guys, we're going to run the ball. We're going to run off tackle right here. doesn't matter. We can, we'll tell you. Well, I would have you to imagine, have to... Uh, Monty, I'd have to imagine, particularly with college kids, mm -hmm. if, if they love mm -hmm. Harbaugh, um, as I imagine they do, this, this must be a really easy way to take a really good football team and have them even more motivated on Saturdays. Oh, absolutely, and and they have this shirt. They had a shirt at the end of the game, and even Charles Woodson had one. That said Michigan versus everybody, yeah. And that is such a rallying cry because even before Harbaugh got into his, uh, you know, he had this was sit out three games in the beginning of the season. But even before that, you know, everybody was downplaying them because of the schedule in which they played. It's hard if you're Michigan to try and schedule non-conference games with teams that have aspirations to be. To, to, to win national championships, tough teams, because they're not going to want to do it. They don't want their season ruined from the beginning. So I, I understand the, the dilemma that some of these top teams and top programs deal with when they're trying to get out their non-conference schedules because it's just people just don't want to mm -hmm. do it. There's really no incentive to do it. So, I mean, because you're a Super Bowl champion that came out of Michigan, I'm sure they're going to leave you great tickets for the Maryland game, right? Uh, no, I, I went to the Rutgers game. A couple of years ago, I took my kids. I told them how great I was in college, and I went to went to the athletic director and got some tickets. Man, I got altitude sickness. How high they put me? Really? <laughs> oh no, that's not they right. Well, those are bad. Those are the bad people. Bowl. The guy next to me was like, "Wait a minute, didn't you? Why are you here sitting with me? Aren't you?" <laughs> it was pretty. And you know, it probably bad, embarrassed yeah, you in front of your kids. It was awful. Why would they do that? Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, you know, I wasn't uh, glowing. I didn't give glowing reviews uh, for Harbaugh in his first couple of years as he was losing to Michigan State and Ohio State every year. Um, I just wasn't something that I was real happy about as a former Wolverine. And now uh, he's doing it, so I'm happy. But, you know, I guess they don't forget the old stuff. <laughs> wow. Who's your quarterback in Michigan? Oh, it was, uh, it was Elvis Gerbach, Kerry Collins. Then it was Scott Dreisbach, and then it was um, Brian Greasy. Oh wow! Wow, that's quite the list. Yeah, Big quite Turner. the list of quite the list of mediocre quarterbacks. No, no, I mean, oh, Kirk Collins was, was no, the no, Super Bowl. They all went to the NFL. What are you talking about? Every single one of those quarterbacks played yeah. in the NFL. No, no, no. Uh, Every you know quarterback what? that threw me a pass threw me a pass. Amani, let me let me NFL. let me correct myself because you're right. Uh, an interesting list of of a very pedestrian NFL quarterbacks. Good, I mean, okay. Elvis Kirk was a great. Who threw the player. most catchable ball, Amani? Oh, it was definitely Kerry Collins. I mean, Todd Collins. Todd Wait, Collins. was it Todd or Kerry? Todd was. But Kerry uh, went Todd to Penn Collins State. My, my, yeah, Kerry was my my quarterback coach. My my quarterback in uh, my junior sophomore ju junior year. Todd Collins. Todd Kerry Collins, was, and he was, he threw was, the most like, catchable yeah. ball. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the last quarterback I ever played with was Kerry Collins, though. You know what's you know what's sad though, Amani. If you want to go see the Michigan Michigan uh, Maryland game, Peter could probably would get you better seats than Michigan would give you. No, like. they don't care about me. I, I, I got nothing. <laughs> if Maryland hooked them up I the way know. Michigan hooked them up, he would have walked out of the building. Yeah, as you should have. Yeah, you're above yeah, that. No, but you know, I mean, but my kids were there, and it was raining. It was like we we tregged all the way to get through the parking lot with their whole. They have a whole situation where you can't park anywhere near, and you have to take these buses. 
over, which is something that I'm not used to doing. You know, no, no because it, it should be done. No, wait, wait, one second. Uh, yeah. Did you say that Collins was a better quarterback than Eli? Yeah, he threw me the ball more. Oh. Be- beautifully. <laughs> wow, you wiggle out of that. Beautifully yeah. sad, Amani. Oh, boy. Yeah. I love it. Okay. okay, Odell, thanks for the call. <laughs> <laughs> or Keyshawn. Yeah. All right, Amani, yeah. thank you, you so much. Ball, Eli. <laughs> Talk to you soon, buddy. No, but Eli was great. He was great. I'm, I'm, I'm happy being facetious. I think Eli... Um, the mentality that he had, he was always ready in the fourth quarter when things yeah. needed to be done, but still, right. that didn't help me in terms no, of... No, no, uh, no. You got to get these catches. You, we got to get these numbers When up. you open up your dispensary, which I, I think you should numbers. call the chronic, we'll do a show from there. The chronic? Oh, I would love to have you guys there, but I don't know at Disney. I don't know if you guys... <laughs> that might be tough. Yeah, well, that might just be tough. don't spark one up, and then we could do it, all right? No, no, no. It's, you know, I hope every, everybody's got to be over, you know, 21 and over. There you go. Use and all that stuff. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Imani. Thanks, Imani. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. All right, that's the Imani <laughs> Tumor Report brought to you by the New York Structural Steel Painting Contractors Association. Adding a little color to the paper. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. How you doing? I'm doing good. How you guys doing? We're doing fine, thank you. So obviously a big decision you make during the game that you're going to sit down Zach Wilson, and today you announce uh, he's not going to uh, start on Friday. What's behind the decision? He's been struggling for a while, but why now, Coach? You know, we've been, um, over the last couple of weeks, have been just trying to make changes along the offense. And, um, you know, we did some things at the running back position, receivers, tight ends, O-line, and... Um, uh, even move the coordinator up to the box, and so we're we're now trying the quarterback to see if we can uh, uh, do something a little bit different there. So it's a uh, um, like I've said, every, uh, everyone's kind of had their hand in the cookie jar, and we're just trying to find the best way to um, uh, get the offense moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you when you because you move Hackett up to uh, to the press box, you, you you had to let Carter go. Uh, at some point, you have to hold the quarterback responsible, right? If you, if other guys are going to be have to move or have to kind of rejigger their their situation, then why not the quarterback? Uh, no, you're 100 percent right, and that was the whole thing. It's just quarterback wasn't at fault for everything around him, and um, but he he does have his responsibility to it. He knows that, and he knows he's got to play better, but. Uh, um, you know, with uh, last week, we just tried to make moves to see if we could spark the offense in some way. Uh, obviously, it didn't work, and, uh, and and now we're trying to quarterback. I think, not that you need this for me, I think you've been incredibly patient with him. I just want to dig down in that third quarter. Why at that point you say, okay, enough is enough is enough? Um, well, one is... Uh, Thought we finished the first half strong. Um, obviously, the first half started a little bit rocky. Finished it strong. I really thought we'd come out a lot better in the second half. Uh, defensively, we um, two uncharacteristic plays that led to a couple of touchdowns for them. A couple of three and outs later, and uh, it was just one of those deals where it was, it was 29 to six, and felt like it, it just we needed to do something, anything, and um, and uh, so that, that was just about it. Coach. Should we believe that Boyle can be successful in this offense? Because, frankly, it feels like if you waited this long, given how things have been, it doesn't, to me, give the biggest vote of confidence that you guys think this guy's capable of running the offense well. No, it's not, it's not that. I think, I think what you have is a, a, the opportunity for a young man who's uh, um, excited for an opportunity. And uh, Tim's been working hard. He's in here at damn near 6 o'clock every morning uh, getting the playlist. Uh, preparing himself the way he needs to prepare, and I thought he did a couple of really nice things against the uh, the Bills when he did come in. Albeit it's a li- little bit different temperature of a football game at that point, but uh, um, you know this is more about his opportunity and him getting an opportunity to take advantage of it. Because you, you know, like I like I've said, you never know what you have until that person gets an opportunity. And he's and I know if if I know anything, I know that Tim's going to attack the heck out of it. Why is um, Zach active as the third back of quarterback? Why not have him inactive? Um, well, you, you're when you have uh, 
three quarterbacks on the roster, you're with the new league rules. Um, you can have the third quarterback active uh, in the event you lose your first two. So was Simeon active all this time? If you lost the first two? No, he's been. Uh, we have an extra roster spot, so we're mm-hmm. more planning on getting him up to the uh, to the fifty three. Gotcha. gotcha. Is, is it on, is it on the table, Coach, that he's thrown his last pass as a Jet? Uh, I, I will address that in the uh, uh, in the off season. You know, I'm, you never know what might happen over the next course of the course of the next six games or eight, seven, whatever we have left, seven, uh, eight. So I, eight. I'm going to ask you a question that maybe it's not even for you, Coach, but you're the one we have on. I never understood this. We talked about it during the summer. You got Aaron Rodgers, 39 years old. I mean, 39 is 39, no matter how what kind of shape he's in. And you guys elected to have Zach Wilson as the backup quarterback after he was benched twice last year. And the reason you go out and get Rodgers is because Zach couldn't play well enough last year to take you where you wanted to go. Why did you guys not have a more experienced backup quarterback than Zach Wilson? Uh, that's a fair question, Mike. Um... You know, when you look at the overall body of work for Zach on the field, I get it. You know, there's it's uh, a lot to be desired, and and most most of it was a confidence issue. It's not an arm talent issue. It's not an athleticism issue. Um, and we felt like if we can get him the redshirt year that we never gave him in year one, uh, he'd have the opportunity to grow and be the quarterback that I think we all believe he's capable of being. And um, yeah, I don't think anyone anticipated. Uh, Aaron going down in four plays. I think worst case scenario in anyone's mind would have been that he plays a few games and Zach at least gets to observe and watch Aaron handle the huddle, handle game week, handle preparation, handle practice, handle uh, the communication with his teammates, handle the sideline, and he can absorb and take it all in, how he studies tape, how he uh, 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 rehab and regen and all that good stuff. And um and he missed it. Yeah, uh, he we never he never got to see that opportunity. He never got to uh, to see that happen. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but it, it was a collective uh, decision. And that, you know, we we see the talent, we see the athleticism, we see the work ethic. If we could just get him that uh, the redshirt year, we we felt like he could be the quarterback that he could be. But so many opportunities and just never really taking it. As you said, that the talent seems to be there. It just never connected. How much? responsibility does a team take for the failure of a player or ultimately the failure of a pick? I I always look inward first. Um, When a player doesn't have success in this league, as a coach, you feel, ultimately, you always feel responsible. And, um, you know, there's there's a series of unfortunate events for for Zach. You know, the... uh, um, I, I love that our O line is scrapping and they're fighting, but you know you got a lot of young guys playing for the first time, and they're you know with all the turnover and the lack of continuity, and you can make a lot of excuses uh, for why, but at the end of the day, you know you you still try to put your best foot forward, and you still try to create the best game plans possible, you still try to be your absolute best every day, and um, you know so you know I can I can create I can be a sympathizer, but at the end of the day, we're all we're all expected to to be great and find ways to win football games. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm always going to look inward. All right, speaking of the offensive line, what's the word on Beckton? Um, he's dealing with an ankle. Uh, I'll have more information tomorrow. Um, but um, right now, we're there. He, he's still got to go through the MRI machine and all that good stuff. All right, I'm going to let you open yourself up right here. You can choose to take it or not. I mean... <laughs> The guy that you built this team around went down in four plays. Your offensive line has had injury after injury after injury, no continuity whatsoever. The guy who backed up the the guy that you built the team around has not played well. Do you ever take the time, Robert, to sit back and feel sorry for yourself and go, how how could this have happened? Everything that we wanted to have happened this year, it's gone wrong. So do you allow yourself that? Um, Here's the best way I'll answer this one. I have a beautiful wife and seven unbelievable children who I get to go home to every day, and they don't let me feel sorry for myself. And um, at the end of the day, we're blessed to be where we are. We're blessed to be able to face the adversity that we get to face every day, and uh, we're blessed to give uh, to coach our butts off for the guys who are getting the opportunity to step on the field, and that's all we can ask for. I, w- I wonder if you if you can allow yourself to think like this. I said at the beginning of the show, and I truly believe it, I I don't think this is on you. 
But there are a lot of Jet fans that want, you know, they want blood and they, they say it's the coach's fault. Everything that's gone wrong, Robert, well, do, do, I mean, do you worry that you'll lose your job because of things that are out of your control? Oh, I, I don't worry about that. Like, we're, you know, it's, uh, this is, this is a, it's a league-wide thing. We're the low-hanging fruit, you know, the head coach, the play caller, and the quarterback are uh, the most visible aspects of football, and they're the easy ones to, they're the soft place to land, and that's okay. Uh, um, you know, we, we expect the responsibility, and, um, and we continue to work, and that's all you can do. And, you know, our focus right now is uh, uh, the Miami Dolphins, and that's all we can do. Robert, you mentioned there's a lot of hands in the cookie jar as far as the mistakes that are concerned with this team. So, clearly, it would be better with Aaron Rodgers. But how much better would it be if the offensive line would play poorly, the pre-snap penalties, the drop passes? Uh, do you ever wonder, would it, would it have lived up to the expectations had Aaron Rodgers stayed looking at how the rest of the team is played? I don't know. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a fair question. We'll never know. Hypothetical, I guess. You'd, you'd like to think it would. Um, you'd like to think in another, in another universe somewhere out there, and, and the, you know, you're, you've got a healthy old line. There's continuity and... And the quarterback is uh, is playing, but uh, and and we're not suffering injuries, and we can play with a fully loaded deck, you know. And uh, um, and you look at it and say, man, we'd be this record and this record. But uh, uh, at the same at the same time, there's no point. You're just wasting time when you do that. We got to focus on the moment. And the moment tells us that Tim Boyle is our quarterback. Um, these are our five starting offensive linemen. These are these are our skill guys, and we got to find a way to score points. Did you communicate with anybody else when the decision was made to pull the plug on Zach yesterday? Um, no, it was my decision. I, yeah, obviously, I asked the offensive coaches how his head was, and Zach was in a good headspace. He was ready to play. I just at that moment, it was strictly my decision. When you spoke to Zach today and said, "All right, we're going to start Tim," what did he say? Um, Zach was good. You know, we we had a really good discussion, and uh, I'm not going to talk about everything we talked about, but um, he was about as good as you could be, and and uh, he understands everything. He he takes responsibility. He recognizes the things that he needs to to get better at. He recognizes some opportunities that were missed, but he, you know, and, and we had a really good talk. You know, I, I'll I'll keep I'll keep expressing it. He's only 24. Um, he's going to have a successful career, and. Uh, and I still think that he's got plenty of time to take advantage of all his talents and his athleticism and his arm talent, his work ethic and all that. And he's he's still going to make an impact in this league. Uh, you, go ahead, Don. There were, I think, a handful of times that there were Friday games during COVID. But, like, what, what's your template for preparing for the first ever Black Friday game and the, and the challenges of that? Um... You know, it's a uh, we, we we have a template. We have our own model. Um, going with, talking with our performance staff and all that, and trying to figure out what's best for the player. Because there's a there's a mental preparation to get yourself ready for the game. There's a mental um, preparation in terms of uh, easing your mind. You know, in terms of where you're not just uh, on full go, 100 miles an hour, uh, seven days a week. Uh, there's a physical aspect of it, um, so you're, there's a there's a balance of not overworking the guys, both mentally and physically, for that matter. Uh, so there's balance. So we've 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 been working on this since uh, since the schedule came out, trying to find the best plan, talking to different teams, and and doing a lot of research. And so we put together the best schedule we could based on the research that we've uh, that we've had, and uh, hopefully it works out. Your defense has been a beast all year. Yesterday, they did not play as well as they've played. Do you think it finally caught up with them, Coach, that they've had to play perfect? They've had to play a perfect game in order for you guys to have a chance to win. Do you think it finally got them yesterday? Um, credit to Buffalo. I, I thought they did a really nice job, but uh, in the second half, the the first two series of the second half were a little disappointing, obviously. The, um, you know, when, you know, the the defense doesn't need to get five takeaways. It doesn't need to score. It doesn't need to pitch a shutout. It just needs to execute to the standard that we believe in. And if we do that, it, we have to trust that it'll be good enough. And that's, uh, I do believe when you start putting stress on yourself and you start feeling frustration and you start trying to press and make plays that don't need to be, the only play that needs to be made is the play, that, the play that's available to you. And I think when you start pressing to make other people's plays, it leads to mistakes. And, um, so, yes, I, I don't think we played up to our standard. I do think Buffalo uh, deserves some of that credit. 
but um, but at the same time, we just got to refocus on us, refocus on what we're capable of, and, and play to the best of our ability, and whatever happens, happens. Right, Coach. Don? Thanks, man. All right, guys. Really uh, I, I just want to say one thing. Guys. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I need I need to talk to you at some point because I have a great wife. I have two great kids. And when things go bad at work, I always feel sorry for myself. So you have to get me through this. Uh, you have the answer. Don't, and I don't. don't I do always it. feel sorry for myself. First of all, it's not going to work, and you don't have the time. <laughs> uh, you, you know what? You, you can't feel sorry for yourself in this world. No one cares. No one wants your sob story, man. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I know it's a sob story, so I can feel sorry for myself. That's that's what I'm saying. But I give you credit. Like, hang in there, man. I, I'll be at the game Friday, uh, so I'll see well, you. How can you, how, how, how can you go home and see your family and not, not, not feel that joy all over again, man? <laughs> you know, so... But, no, I'm with you. I feel you. But um, we're still blessed, man. You got it. Happy cool, Thanksgiving, man. my friend. All right, guys. All right. Thanks, Coach. That was the Robert Sala Report brought to you by Infinity.com. Discover more about the luxury and performance of an Infinity QX60 crossover at InfinityUSA.com or visit your local Infinity dealer today in Sloman. Sloman's has low price home heating oil for all New York football fans. Low prices, zero sacrifices. For 100 years, Sloman's has been a staple in home comfort. Call 1-866-OIL deal. So interesting words from Robert. Your attention please ladies and gentlemen you're watching yes. Tonight it is a um, rematch of the Super Bowl and maybe even a preview of the Super Bowl which makes it all the more exciting and it's the Chiefs and the Eagles tonight on ABC and ESPN and Scott joins us now. Scott how you doing? Really good, really good. Uh, just before we get going, if I forget on the way out, happy Thanksgiving to you and the boys and their families and everybody in the city. It's uh, it's fun to be on with you and, and a great game tonight. Absolutely, you too, buddy. I, I, I'm one. I'm wondering this. We all love going to work every single day, but when you have a game like this, is there more juice for you? No doubt. Now, listen. I, I, funny, I was thinking about that driving to the airport, like. I mean, look, we're all blessed. We get to do this. It's a get-to job, not a got-to job. Um, but there's certain days, uh, and I'm sure it's the same, you know, for you. You're going to the stadium for a massive night. of The, the stakes are high, and it's a regular season game. Just that. But as regular season games go, it's it's huge. It's one of those ones when the schedule came out back, you know, last spring. You think, wow, this has a chance. But you just never know. Like injuries. Look, look, look at the with the city, which you guys have dealt with with injury. I mean, things change. But these teams are both really good. Their records are really good. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's always fun. But this is one where you just a little more little more juice for certain. And it feels like it's open up again for Kansas City to represent the AFC. Are are you seeing or sensing any chief fatigue? at how it just seems that the path is going through Kansas City, maybe not to the New England level, but it's starting to get there. Yes. I, I, listen, I'm, I'm, on, uh, I, I'm open about this, Don. I just I want Kansas City to have to have a, a road game at some point in Patrick Mahomes' career. <laughs> right. I just think that you th – think about, think about what Eli did on the road, particularly like those, those games in Lambeau on the road. Like winning a Super Bowl is awesome. I don't care where you do it. But if you've got to go on the road at some point, it, it gives you a chance to stamp yourself in a different way, which is not to say Mahomes isn't already great. We know this. But it just at some point, I just don't want them to have to, to be able to have a, a, a buy through Arrowhead. Like, get, go to Baltimore, go someplace. And so, I think that's my, my fatigue. It's just that that they're already good enough. <laughs> the fact that they're that, that they earn, let's be clear, earn the right to play at home. Uh, I just want to have to see them play a road game at some point. But you're right; the, the way things are breaking this year could be the Arrowhead Invitational yet again. Any truth to the rumor, Scott, that I'm hearing that you have a sit down one on one with the. Uh... Um, Taylor Swift? No, no. She's apparently, I think she's staying back in Brazil, oh, Michael. That, bad come on. A bad job. That, that, That's oh, a huge game. Yeah. I, I, well, listen, I mean, for fans, you know, she stayed back apparently. I, 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 we joked about it as a group. Like, if I... I yeah, look, we, we meet you meet famous people, and Peter's in a different space in the music space where you know that's not the lane that I travel in. But I, I would, I'm glad that that there is not going to be some remote opportunity of an awkward interaction where I'm telling her my my my, my wife and daughter were at the one and and, and where it rained in Gillette and your piano got ruined. I, I hope you have fun tonight. Okay, I have to go by because I'd 100% do that. I humiliate myself in like a two-second interaction. You must have heard our interview with Kenny Albert when he talked about meeting Taylor Swift at the Garden. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's very familiar. Is that what happened? <laughs> oh, yeah. They're very close now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 I know you wouldn't picture it, but Kenny Albert and Taylor Swift, very tight. Very tight. Right. Very, very tight. Yeah. They, they, they might, right they, they might uh, actually be closer if Kenny didn't have such a busy schedule. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Ken, yeah. Kenny can't make time. Yeah. <laughs> They could summer together if they if the schedule would allow, right? Right, right, that's true. All right, so we, we've been talking about this for most of the show. Let's get your take. They finally benched Zach Wilson yesterday. He loses his job. He's not starting the Black Friday game. Um, can this guy recover in New York, or is that it for him? Done. Done. Got to be. Got to be. I mean, I can't do it. He just you can't he can't do it and and I mean that I'm not I'm not the mean spirited person in our business I don't I don't take you know joy in you know swan diving on people and being rude about it I just think look at it look, you've had enough of an opportunity to demonstrate if you could their O line issues are real we understand that sure but I just I, I just maybe just here is, is another place could could it work somewhere maybe I don't know. But it's, it's, I just don't see how, you know, they're giving him runway. And, he, you know, no pun intended. I mean, if he, could, if he could fly, he would. He has them. So I just, I don't see how it works here. See, I brought this up earlier in the show. Uh, it, 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 I'm almost mad they benched him because I feel like I've been lied to for the last month. All he kept here, oh, no, you don't see it, Don. He's starting to get better. I know he's thrown three picks. I know he hasn't scored a touchdown. But we look, if you look at it through expert eyes, you can see the belt. And then you pull the plug on him, and rightfully so. But it almost feels like I've been lied to for a month. Well, if you you're only lied to if you let yourself believe it is, is <laughs> well, how I put it. I mean, you, 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 there's there's 60 minutes of tape every Sunday or Monday to tell you that that this is what it is. I mean, at some point he'd have shown you, and we could look. We can go back to that brief second quarter against Kansas City if we want, but I mean, it's just too much. There's too much evidence to the contrary. Um, and, I mean, the fact that they're going to a guy in Boyle, I, our, our colleague Bill Barnwell tweeted it out. The numbers are astoundingly bad. I think since he's entered the league, there's like 91 quarterbacks who've thrown 100 passes, and his QBR is 90 out of 91. That's who they're going to instead of Zach Wilson. At Crazy. This point. So, to me, that's all you need to know. You know, we were talking about this earlier, Scott, and, and you know, a lot of people are going to pile on Robert Sala. I don't think that he deserves the lion's share of the blame. And Peter and I have said this since the summer. Going into a season with a 40-year-old quarterback and having Zach Wilson who was benched twice already as your backup quarterback is, we like to joke about this phrase, professional malfeasance. This is not on Sala. This is the backup quarterback he was given, and it's the wrong backup quarterback for a team that had Super Bowl aspirations. Completely agree. And it's it's tricky, though, right, because you drafted the guy. You used that capital to take him, and you get Aaron Rodgers because you were able to. And, but but having no having no plan behind that, although isn't Boyle like isn't Boyle close with Rogers? I mean, isn't there some sort of affinity yep. there or something? I don't know. But you 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 need look. This league has the Giants have lived with this, right? I mean, Tyrod, who I told you in an earlier visit, I'm a fan of. I think he's a competent professional backup. Then he gets injured, and then you have to go to Devito, and he had a couple of struggles. And then the, the medicine for him was the game against Washington, which I don't know if we'll get into. Mm -hmm. Don't need to if you don't want to. <laughs> um, but you, you've got to. You just have to have someone behind your starter that can do it if he's needed because the odds are, unfortunately, in this league, pretty decent that you're going to need him at some point. And this is what they had, and it just hasn't been enough. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to go there, but not really from the commander's perspective, but from the Giants' perspective. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> As a Giant fan, not an analyst or a uh -huh. talk show, I enjoyed yesterday. And I know a lot of Giant fans are like, no, you want to lose every game. You want to get that draft pick. First of all, I don't believe in tanking. I don't even know who the best quarterback is going to be coming out of the draft. I don't think anybody knows right now. But I thought they needed to They need to feel good. You want to build a winning culture. I want to know I've got a coach. I want to know I've got some players. So I enjoyed yesterday. Am I wrong for enjoying my team winning a football game? No, you're not at all. Because as a Washington fan, I'll take you back to when Washington played the Giants the, the, Ch the year of the Chase Young draft. And the, the Giants beat Washington in a game in overtime. And I remember being giddy because I thought, thank God they lost because now it means you can get Chase Young. Well, yeah, how'd great. that work out? Yeah. You know, that was the prize. And it just didn't turn out. There's, there's no guarantee on the other side of tanking that it's going to work. Like, look at the Philadelphia 76ers, right? You know, trust the process. Okay. Well, what, what was the end result of that? Well, it hasn't been anything yet. So 
I'm with you, Don. I say win, enjoy winning when you win, particularly against a division rival. And, you know, I, go back to the, the loss uh, in the game prior where they looked so bad mm-hmm. and, and, it, and it seemed like they're falling apart on the sidelines. And I think everyone was pissed because they didn't sign up to be terrible. And so they, they played 60 really good minutes. They turned Washington over six times. DeVito throws, uh, what, three touchdowns? And so... Okay, it, it, does it hurt you in the draft position? Maybe, but do you know for sure what you're getting? No. So I, I'm with you. I, I enjoy a win, particularly over an NFC East rival, all, every single chance you get. Isn't it odd, though, Scott? We'll talk with Scott Van Pelt. He's leading you into Monday Night Football tonight, uh, Chiefs against Eagles. Isn't it odd that a guy who was not drafted, who went to two colleges, um, he was the third string backup, and, I mean, I think all four of us can make the argument that he's better than Zach Wilson. I don't know, man. Look, look at the two games. That, the, look at the two games prior. I mean, yeah, but he was it, he was they, learning they, how to they, walk. They, say that again. He was learning how to walk in those two games. Understood. I mean, it, and that's fair. That that that's that's fair. I, I but we're. I mean. <laughs> You can just run in New York City and your quarterbacks are DeVito and Boyle. I can't even believe it. It's uh, crazy. <laughs> and, and I didn't see it. Scott, I don't know how you felt. I mean, obviously, I was in a bad way yesterday, and so all of my yeah. anger was, was focused on Washington. But I don't know, man. Even the completions I saw I saw DeVito make, I mean, these were guys wide open. I just was not – on paper, it looks great, and I'm happy for the kid that he got the game under his belt. But I, never, I didn't come away feeling like I'd learned much about Tommy DeVito yesterday. Well, there was that one play in particular that, that they ran to the left side of the field where it felt like they did it once. Slayton was there once. It, it, I felt like they, it was a tight end once. It was like – five absolutely buck-naked receivers <laughs> that, that got, like, chunk plays over and over and over. Uh, things, things, the, the wheels are falling off the bus in Washington as if as if there were a bus to begin with, as if it ever had wheels to begin with. It's a great I point. Mean, it, it felt like... It felt like it felt like yesterday was sort of the end for for that uh, administration, so to speak. Um, but I, again, I, I don't know that, that yesterday means that this that, that Devito can do it moving forward. But to the point you were making in the question, Michael, we haven't seen Wilson have a day like that ever against anyone. Right. So sure, um, you know it's all context and. Uh, and, you know, for 60 minutes anyway, uh, the Giants and their fans got to celebrate the way their defense competed and that their quarterback, you know, threw some touchdown passes. All right, so we'll end it where we began it. Thank you so much. Eagles and the yep. Chiefs tonight, Monday Night Football. You know how we feel about you. Have you uh, hope you and your family have a great Thanksgiving. Appreciate you, and we'll, uh, we'll see you all at 6 for Countdown, and we'll be around for Sports Center when it's done if you all are bored. So we'll see you there. Sounds Thanks, good. Scott. Thanks, Scott. All right, so that's Scott Van Pelt. A little quick look at the uh, – the Monday night game and the the Giants and the Jets. We've been talking about it the entire day. It's Kay LaGreca Rosenberg and you right here. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching. Yes. Just dreadful in the first half. Will they ever go to another quarterback, or are they just locked into this guy and they have a point to prove? Well, you know, I, I agree with you, Michael. I, I don't think this was the week to bench him because I think he did some positive things in the game the other night, the last interception notwithstanding. But, uh, yeah, it would have to be, I think, he'd have to be sabotaging their offense. And by that I mean, like, committing, like, bad interceptions and, and things of that nature for them to pull him out of the game. I just think they do not want to have to do that. And benching him now... I mean, they have two. They're gonna have in, in like a five to six day span because they got the Black Friday game. So I don't really see him getting benched after the Buffalo game because then you're gonna start a quarterback, a new quarterback, on a short week to to face the first place team. Uh, I don't see. But if he doesn't get better in the next two games, then they'll have that mini bye week before the next game, which I think is Atlanta. That would be the place to do it. Um, but like I said, it would have to get extremely bad for, to, for them to play the game. Uh, and I, I think he gives them the best chance to win. I know Jets right. fans are driving off the right now when they're hearing that. But, you know, what has Tim Boyle ever done, you know, in the league? He's 0-3 as a starter. I mean, that's been- change for the sake of change and and i don't think that's a healthy thing to do again see that's where i was going to go the conspiracy theory is somebody is forcing sala to play wilson but the better question is why are there no better alternatives i understand that aaron Rodgers got hurt he got hurt in week one 
We've got we've had months here. They went and signed Trevor Simeon. Why? To just not dress and be a part of the practice squad? Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense why they weren't aggressive. Never mind getting a veteran backup to be ahead of Wilson at the start of the season. Why didn't they find a better alternative over the last couple of months? Well, how many teams have a good third-string quarterback? I mean, it's it's really hard to. I mean, a lot of teams don't even have. No, but you went and signed Trevor. Was Trevor Simeon the best available quarterback to go sign that you didn't even dress? Like there wasn't anybody that could leapfrog over Boyle and be an alternative here as we head into Week Eleven. Well, I mean, everyone's talking about Josh Dobbs now. What he's oh, about Carson Wentz or, or any anybody that would at least be a pulse? I don't understand how you sign somebody that couldn't leapfrog over Boyle. Unless they're just married to Boyle because he knows the system from Green Bay. Yeah, well, that's part of it, too. Uh, Don, I think the mistake was made back in February and March when they decided to make Zach Wilson their number two quarterback. I, I think that's when they should have got a Jacoby Brissett or, or Gardner Minshew and said either cut bait with Zach Wilson or get him the third quarterback and say, hey, this is going to be a redshirt year, um, especially when they went out and got Aaron Rodgers, a 40-year-old guy who you know there's a chance he might break down. So that's where the mistake by Joe Douglas, and it's really hard to correct that mistake once the season gets started. And they committed to him even after seeing two years of substandard quarterback play. They still committed to him as their backup, and the worst case scenario, case scenario came true on the fourth play of the season. And now they have to live with this guy. Could they have been more aggressive? Carson Wentz, his agent, did call the Jets. He said, hey, you want to sign my guy? And the Jets said no. So the Josh Dobbs thing, I think Josh Dobbs does over a sustained period of time. He's had a couple of really good weeks here with Minnesota. But I want to see how that plays out. Now, Rich, before I let you go, there, there, uh, from what it sounds like to my ear, somebody is continuing to try to call you. And uh, I keep hearing that clicking. So if if somebody, God forbid, is not dead, that person that keeps calling you should get punched right in the throat by right, you the next time you see them. More of a forehead. I get, I, you know, I didn't even look at my phone. I'm so clued into our conversation see. here. But I did I did hear the phone ring. But I, 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 I want to give you guys my undivided attention. No, no, you, you did a great call. job. You're but, a professional. Uh, you're you're a total pro. Call. It's this person that keeps calling in. Maybe they know you're on the air. Maybe they're trying to be cute. Punch that person in the throat, right. Rich. I'm just saying. Do it. Okay, I'm sorry about that. If it's annoying. <laughs> no, uh, no. But, no. But, but, that person owes the apology, not I'm, you. I'm shocked that you, I did not hear. Oh, easily. Yeah, oh, I've got, I've got the ears of a hawk. And that's not no, true. I, I, I heard it. Yeah. Too. Anthony didn't hear it either. Wow. Well, I uh, I will uh, talk to you soon. I'll I'll be there on Black Friday, so maybe I'll you know I'll say hello if I see you. Well, if, if this that could be a big game. I mean, believe it or you know, if the, if the Bills lose this week, I mean, if the Jets beat the Bills and Miami loses to Vegas, the Jets and Dolphins are playing for first place. Amazing. As crazy as that sounds, you know, it's it's crazy, and uh, that would be a fun situation. But the Jets have to score a touchdown. Uh, yeah, that the helps. Oh, oh touchdown! Yeah, that, those that helps. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Rich. That might help. Him. Sorry, guys. See you soon. Be Take good. Care. Rich Samini covers the Jets. Has been doing it over 30 years and does it for us. Does it very, very well. 1-800-919-3776. We'll reset when we come back. Big 5 o'clock hour. You don't know. But first, Peter is going to tell us about better help. your restaurant can do with tools from Square. Get a POS that connects to a KDS so you can handle orders ASAP. Reach more customers with online ordering and QR codes. Use pocket-sized hardware so you can turn tables faster. And get one account for everything so you can take care of it all and take it easy too. Get your all-in-one restaurant system and sign up at square.com today. Custom Ink helps to celebrate and drive our students' achievements with custom gear. They love Custom Ink's different styles and designs. We love how Custom Ink makes the process simple with their easy-to-use design lab, expert artists ready to help, and unbeatable customer service. 
Custom Make allows our kids to show everyone their accomplishments and the pride they have in our school. When we place an order, I know they got our back so we can focus on the kids. Custom Ink has hundreds of products to help you feel connected. Upload your logo or start your design today at customink.com. I'm Jesse Dover, co-founder of Dagny Dover. New York isn't for the faint of heart. The gear you carry around not only has to look good, but it has to work even better. That's why we create bags like the Land and Carry All, a bag that allows organizational junkies like me to be ready for whatever life brings. A bag that allows me to feel good about the things I carry. After all, this city is a reflection of who I am, purposeful, resilient, and ready to face whatever comes my way. My oily hair was just controlling my life. I've always had a sensitive scalp and dry hair. My frizz was still out to here. And the Pros Quiz told me that hard water and air pollution are making my problems a lot worse. The Pros sent me my custom formula with clean ingredients specifically made for me. Now my hair is healthy. My scalp is finally happy. And it's completely transformed my hair. With ButcherBox, you never have to worry about what's for dinner. We deliver grass-fed beef, organic, free-range chicken, humanely raised pork, wild-caught seafood, and so much more. Get high-quality meat sourced from trusted partners with free shipping always. Get a 10 to 14 pound turkey free in your first box. Butcher Box. Did you see that? Yep. Looks like rain. Also looks like... Mick Delivery. Order Mick Delivery in the app. Has intelligent all-wheel drive. So does my Altima. Now get a low $349 per month lease on Rogue or get a low $289 per month lease on Altima. Better hurry. These offers won't be back in stock. We asked seniors how to prevent Medicare scams. If you get a phone call, do not talk to the person. Never, ever give out your Medicare number. Just hang up. I check my Medicare statements monthly. To report Medicare fraud, contact the Senior Medicare Patrol in your state. Lorvis. What does that mean? We were trying to come up one day with a, a couple name for them, and we couldn't get anywhere. And then we said, you know what you do? You, the, a caller suggested you take the lore of Taylor and the vis of Travis, and you make their and you make the Lorvis, <laughs> Lorvis. their sexy couple name. Sounds like a like a monster. I love Lorvis. Godzilla versus Lorvis. I mean, what do you? What, if you're the if you're the Kelsey family? I mean, granted, they have two NFL playing sons, which is a which is a big deal. But up until Kelsey became Taylor Swift's partner, they probably lived a relatively normal life. It's got to be a little weird getting together with the Swifts. No, no, no. They they weren't living a normal life with the Super Bowl. She's doing commercials and all. Their life was she. You mean the mom? Oh, the mom was in. A, oh, yeah, she was in a commercial yeah. this past Super Bowl. A couple of them. So they were. All, they'd already taken this. So 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 fun. You have to go back like a few years. So if we were to go back three years, they were still in normal life land. Have you come around that this is true love now? Um, I believe. I think I believe they're in a relationship. Yeah. I I, I think, I believe. That they're in a relationship. So yeah. it's not a work. I think it started out as a work. I'm convinced. Oh, of that. so they fell in love by accident. Well, I don't During even. A work. I don't know. Are they in love? During a work. Well, but they're in yeah. love now. Have you ever heard of arranged marriages where the people stay together for 50 years? I mean, it happens all the time. They're in love. I, I, I think it's there's a relationship. 
but it, it, and they probably were interested. I'm, but I'm sure there was the benefits to all that. It was all worked out. But well, and, and do you together. admit that things like her jumping into his arms clearly in the view of cameras was not an accident? Well, I mean, she's very savvy, but I so, think there's love there. I think that's there's fine, true love. We, well, well, stop it. That was an open mouth a, kiss. Why would you even analyze it enough to know? Like, who cares? I care. Honestly, no, why? These I want to know I why. why. I just care. You're a 62-year-old man. Why would you care who she's with? For God's sake. You didn't sake. care about any of the other guys that she was with. Yeah, you I did. You certainly didn't care who Kelsey was dating. I did care. I don't know. Well, who you? What's your end game? You're like Brian Cashman Light. Like, what is your end game? Yeah. What are you hoping? What, for? what are you hoping? You're hoping that that we'll get the younger demographic. That ship sailed, brother. No, I am. What do you mean it sailed? We, we have the reason right here. He's, he's a forty-four year old man. I'm not a twenty-five year old Taylor Swift fan. I don't want to be with a pig. I think we have to bring an Asman. The... <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, if you really wanted to get after the the young jet demographic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the ass? I did, oh, here it is. Hold on. Ass man. <laughs> yeah, we have to bring him in. Yeah. Well, All right, so let's get back man. to what Rich said. Right. I, it doesn't sound like Sala said we cut him because he made a mistake. But he did not play after that chop block that called back a big play. Didn't play after that. So they were upset with that. And he wasn't getting much time anyway. But was it worth, as Don would say, worth the squeeze to, like, make him an example if you lose well, people in the locker room? But here, here, here's where, again, we're just guessing because outwardly he told us that it was he wasn't going to get any playing time and they want to give him a fresh start someplace else. So that, that could still be the truth. But he also told us he doesn't go public with his discipline. So if it's, if it's a discipline measure... If you go into that room and you're trying to stop penalties, which are clearly a problem, and you tell guys, listen, there is going to be consequences if you guys continue to shoot yourselves in the foot, well, then you got to do something because otherwise it's going to fall on deaf ears. You know what the kids, you keep threatening. I'm going to take the computer, Marco. I'm going to take the computer, Marco, if you don't shut it off. If I don't take the computer, he's now laughing at me. I have to take the computer away from him. or Otherwise, he's going to do what he wants. It's the same with, I'm not saying the players are children, but it's the same way. If you tell them there are going to be consequences if you commit penalties and there's no consequences, how do you expect the penalties to stop? So was he forced into, I got to do something here. They're not listening. I have the extra back. Maybe I have to treat him as an example. But I mean, if you believe what Rich said, it, he, Rich said he didn't think it was a penalty, so it wasn't egregious like Uzama's penalties were. No, you know, it's more that they want to get someone else playing time. That's what I mean. Yeah, but you could still gotten him playing time without re releasing releasing them all together. I know that's the thing that's so annoying about the NFL. It seems like every decision that's made, they will stare right at you and tell you what you're looking at is not hey. what you're looking at. No, we really just wanted to find a, a nice start. Wouldn't you guys view it a little bit though? Not to say that he didn't have a big penalty this past weekend, because he did. But isn't it a little bit like kicking the dog? Well, but we, like, is, 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 is but Michael Carter minute. really... Michael Carter was the example but, that but, needs to get but, set? Wait a minute. Is that really, is that really it? Well, how do you expect to solve the problem? What do we say every single week when the Jets do this? It, it's a reflection on the coaching staff. So what do you want the coaching staff to do? We're, we're past the teaching stage now. We're past the camp stage Every game is so vitally important. These penalties are costing you games. If you want it to stop, that means you've got to do something hard. And the fact that the rest of the locker room liked him, all the better. Yeah. It sends the message to the team like, hey, guys, this is not show friends. It's show business. You just lost one of your teammates that you like because he's committing dumb penalties. You could be next. Let's stop it. But what about could we also call out a more notable player by name? He won't even call it a notable players, more notable players by name. But he said he won't do that. But that's not what he does. Right. But why not? You'd rather, I mean, I guess, listen, Robert Sala's a good dude. I'm, I'm not suggesting right. this is some sort of terrible, malicious thing. But, like, if the honorable thing is to not call people out publicly, Michael, it's better to cut them? Is that the more honorable thing? Well, but, you play? know, it worked, it worked out for but, Carter. He got picked up by a team that's going to use him. Here's the thing, but none of I this guess. is public. Sala went public saying that, it, it, that it's all about the fact that they wanted to change Direction at running back. They were deep at running back, and they wanted him. He was going to sit and do nothing. I'm doing the guy the favor. So publicly, he's telling the world, I'm doing him a favor. But inside that room, he's probably not. So Salah's never going to get called on that. If we ask him that on Monday, he's going to say, I didn't cut it because of the penalty. 
but I'm assuming that behind closed doors, it was because of the penalty, and I admire the fact that he's trying to do something Fair. to get the stop. You know, we're, we're past the ages of running laps, right? That's not the way sports works anymore. Okay, so let me, let me play devil's advocate here. One of the biggest reasons for them losing is Zach Wilson. Mm -hmm. Zach Wilson has two more two more touchdowns than Tommy DeVito. Two more. Sure. He's played all year. Tommy DeVito started one game. So that's a problem. You, but th that's where you draw the line of getting tough. That, that's well, what I don't have. I mean, well, you want to show me something? Uh, when, 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 oh, when Zach Wilson throws that pick to end the game and they end up getting the ball back one more time, <laughs> bring out Tim Boyle. Show me something. I mean, they, they will not move on Zach, no matter but, what he does. But, but we know the answer to that. I guess. Yes. We don't. They still don't tell us that No, because, because the, all, at least it, we, don't, yet we don't know publicly. But you heard Rich Samini say it. It's been speculated. He still gives them the best chance to win. They have other guys that can run the ball aside from Carter. Well, does, does this does this kill them to win a game? But but what they're saying is that Boyle and um, Simeon would give them a worse chance to beat Buffalo. Right. I, I truly believe the reason they haven't pulled Zach is they think the other two guys are they, not, not as good, functional. which tells you how bad the other two guys are. And that's why I think instead of looking at Sala as to why Zach's playing, you got to look at Joe Douglas because I disagree about, well, who else you're going to get in the middle of the season? Come on. There's got to be somebody better than Trevor Simeon, who you don't dress. So I Boyle agree. is your best. But there wasn't anybody else out there. Carson Wentz's people reached out to the Jets. They said, we're good. Are you really good? Apparently not. Now, you could say you could feel it however you want. He's bad for the locker room. What You're telling me that Carson Wentz wouldn't give them a much better chance to make the playoffs than Zach Wilson? And they said no. Yeah, I agree, too. I love Rich, but I didn't understand that logic of they did what was out there. They didn't find a guy who's even capable of being active. Right. That, that's, not, yeah. that's not finding anything. They, they signed Trevor Simeon because you can't move forward without a quarterback on your practice squad. You can't just have two quarterbacks. It was not to challenge for the position. Now, is Joe Douglas being forced to do that because Woody doesn't want anybody to challenge Zach for the job? Or did Joe Douglas just completely drop the ball? But it's not the Giants, too. Why is Tommy DeVito your only alternative? Why, why didn't you sign Carson Wentz? But you we can say, always fall back on the Giants that they don't want to win right now. The but, Jets want to win. But, Michael, how much do you pay a practice squad player? I, I don't know. I'm sure Carson Wentz wouldn't want to be on the practice squad. But when you have somebody as your third quarterback, isn't it possible that that guy might have a chance to play? And the guy that you're playing, you didn't allow to throw the football in a winnable game when you were still alive for the playoffs? Like, you couldn't find somebody else that you could at least have throw the ball to be on your practice squad? Now, Tommy's a great... Hey, as a Giant fan with not much to root for, I'm rooting for him. I want him to do well. He's a Jersey kid. He grew up you know, just uh, down the street from the Willowbrook Mall. But is that giving your team the best chance to win? Isn't that the place that you want Evan Neal booed? Yeah, That's but right. not, not Tommy DeVito. Now, the reason I went there is because Willowbrook, I always was more of a, of a um, Garden State Plaza, Paramus Park guy growing up in North Jersey. Mm -hmm. But Willowbrook, is open on Sunday. They had the blue laws in Bergen County. So we'd have to go to Willowbrook Mall on Sundays. So Sunday, football, boo. That's why I went Willowbrook Mall. It was very strategic. I'm I loved what you did. Interesting. Um, but also back to the um, Carter thing specifically, he has eight attempts this season. So maybe it just does make sense that what, what are we doing? Maybe the logic for Robert Sala was we're keeping this guy around. We're not even giving him the ball. And he's committing a key penalty. There's just there's nothing here. Here's Makai Becton on Carter being cut. Emotions are very low. You know, it's I know it's I know it's a business and things like that. But I hang I, I be around these people every day, so I look at them like family. So when a situation like that happens, I'm always down in the dumps. Like so, you know, it's, it's a business. So I'm I'm hoping, praying he get another opportunity somewhere where he can thrive and be the man that I know he can be, be the player he can be. That's all I can say. Now Izzy Abanaconda, who was a big part of a I guess we just call him Izzy. I guess that you would do if you called their games on radio. Probably, but uh, Abanaconda <laughs> is not that tough. Yeah, he talked about Carter, who he essentially replaced. 
Man, since day one, since I walked in, MC showed nothing but love, man. You know, that's like, I, I grew on to be my brother for real. So even though what, what happened, I was really, like, deep inside and what happened. And then like, I'm definitely going to miss him for sure. I texted him after yesterday, you know, how, how much of an influence he was on me. And uh, even though the whole team, the whole running back room, the whole team, he was a big joy in the team, you know. And then, yeah, I learned a lot from him. So he was just a great guy. Now, I read on social media from one of the reporters that, Izzy was talking to the media, and then a player who, who the person didn't know who it was shouted, you better say something about Michael Carter. Hmm. Let's go to Joe and poor Jeff. Joe. Hey, guys. I uh, love the show. I've been listening to you for years. Interned for you back in the day, so thanks for having oh, me on. Oh, okay. wow. What year? Uh, 2012. Okay, so no, that's a fair... Yeah, 2012, it was Win Sanity. It was Giant Super Bowl. Don loved his banana boat smoothies from Smoothie King. Wow. And, Michael, you never let us get anything for you. You said that uh, that's not what interns are for. I always appreciate oh, so, that. So now where do you fall on that? Did I abuse you and Michael was good, or was I doing the right thing? Not at all. Different approaches, and I, you were both great to me, so oh, right. I have no complaints. You didn't, you didn't let interns I don't get you think, food? I don't think interns should be running for food for us. That's, that's not exactly why they became the, an intern. That's what no. they do. That's they exactly became an intern to learn the business, not to be, no, uh, is, uh, not to be I, Uber I, Eats. Yeah, but what are they going to do? <laughs> Well, yeah, but, what are you going to have to cut? I mean, I mean well, yeah, like, it's exactly, they're not, it's not the old days of giving the kid a razor blade and being like. Yeah, like I wasn't bulking, like I bulked carts and stuff, you know, but I also ran to McDonald's when I was a kid. Yeah. You know what? Listen, what are you doing you now had... for a living? I uh, actually am a high school English teacher now. All right, so I'm sorry the internship didn't work out. <laughs> well, maybe it helps him. <laughs> I, I, I ho I'm glad because we need teachers and you're a bright kid, so I'm glad that it's working out for you. And I'm glad you went to Smoothie well, King also. Smoothie King is tremendous. Yeah. Big fan. It is very good. Uh, anyway, Michael Carter. Um, I was just saying that Michael Carter didn't get cut for a crackback block. He got cut because he just hasn't been very good all year. I think the reason he made it to week 11 is because he's a good locker room guy. But if you look at – he's been playing on third down. And if you look at him, uh, his pressure percentage, he gives up pressure 21% of the time. Uh, and he's 46 out of 47th as a ranked running back as a blocker. He's not as – as Peter said, he's not being used to get a lot of carries. And uh, he's had multiple drop passes this year, too, when his number has been called. So I think that it's just more about production, and I think the Jets actually did the right thing keeping him around as long as they did. The locker room should look at that, that he probably lasted longer than he should have. Well, you know, well Joe, th those are, that's well said, but they only gave him eight carries. That's not exactly giving the guy a shot. Two years ago, the guy played very, very well. And then Brees Hall came around, and they kind of used up the carries and that they, he had. And then they went and got Dalvin Cook. Right. So... I think that when, when teams want to discipline somebody, they look at where they are on the food chain. Of course. So if it was, um, let's say, Garrett Wilson, who made it terrible, they wouldn't touch him. It's somebody who's expendable. That is always how it is. But maybe really in this case, it was just kind of the last straw more than it was some big disciplinary yeah, action. He fumbled a couple of weeks ago. There's a lot of other things that you just, these are tough decisions that you have to make. But you do feel bad because these guys love each other. They hang out every single day. It is weird that one day, you know, you, you show up and yeah. Anthony Pusick's uh, on a different team. Huh? Is he going somewhere? No, I'm just saying that's but what the game is. I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to be that guy. But the players have to get over it. That's the way this world works. And in, in football, come on, you're you're just commodities. Guys get cut all the time. Guys get traded all the time. I, I appreciate that they're a family, but teams are going to make these decisions, Michael. Right? I mean, that's just the way you, you you fall in love with a teammate. He's at your locker one week, and the next week he's on another team or not in the NFL anymore. Let's go to Matt, New Jersey, Matt. Hey guys, thanks for taking my call. You got uh, it. I just want to say. First, uh, you know, love all three of you guys. You're all legends. Forget about that one dude that tried to outcast Peter the other day. Um, You're a nice man, just man. Just wanted to make a couple. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to make a couple points about the Jets. Um, you know, I think Hackett. You know, he was brought in obviously for Rodgers, and I think that it was more so like an Adam Gase, Peyton Manning situation where it's just shut up, I'm going to run my offense, enjoy the success that you get with it. And they keep saying how it's built for Rodgers, it's built for Rodgers, then I, I honestly think that Hackett just doesn't know what he's doing. Like, he, he can't call an offense. You look at Denver, Russell looks great. You know, he looks like his old self a little bit. 
with, uh, you know, an actual offensive guy. But, then, but, but Matt, what do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say to the people, and Aaron Rodgers one of them, with that same offense, with, with Hackett there, he won two MVPs in, in Green Bay. No, but I think he's got his quarterback. He's okay. I think Zach yeah, Wilson I, isn't his what quarterback. I mean is that Rodgers basically, you know, he likes his system. It's a timing system. He likes that. And he basically has free range to call whatever he wants. Right. And I think that ties into McCall Hardman, why they brought him in. Like, you know, get him on the field. Hey, Rodgers is just going to throw a hand signal at him, tell him what to run. But when Wilson's here, he doesn't have that freedom. He doesn't know what to do because he can't read the defense properly. So I just think that, you know, Hackett, he's just kind of one of, you know, like Rodgers' friends, and he's just looking out for him, and he's got that freedom to basically tell his offensive coordinator to take a back seat to me. Yeah, well, that's all well and good, but, you know, Hackett's job is to also adapt to oh. Wilson when you know that, in all likelihood, Rodgers not coming back this year. I mean, the, the whole season hangs in the balance with, with Zach Wilson. She so can't keep forcing you know, a, a, a square peg into a round hole it doesn't work. It's a, it's a different quarterback. He's not as cerebral. He doesn't have the timing down as Rodgers. Let's go to Jimmy in Queens. Jimmy. Hey, what's up, guys? How you doing, Jim? Good. So I, I'm on my last nerve with, with Salah. You know, cutting the third running back is not going to solve the answers. You know, you had last week you had, you had Max Mitchell. That's a right tackle. You put him at guard. And a guy that doesn't play right tackle or right tackle with no help. Lazar's been brutal. Uzama's been brutal. You know what? You can't sit them for a half. You can't sit them for a series. Like, what is cutting the third running back going to do? Well, Cobb's not playing. and it, it, he, He's, he's got to have some wide receivers. Cobb's not playing. Lazard's, you know, some of these guys are, um, are Rodgers guys. Uh, he, 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 there's nothing wrong with doing the, the few things you can do. And also, Lazard has a four-year deal. Yeah, there's a lot of things that, that come into play with that. And yeah, Michael, you bench the guy you can bench. You're not going to bench Aaron Judge, right? You're, you're going to bench the, the, the backups. You're gonna, that's how it works. You do what you can do, and his hands are tied with some of the guys that he can bench. Hey, the Michael K. Show Holiday Party returns on Friday, December 8th. Where, though? At your mother's house. Excuse me? In Garden City Park, Long Island. We're going to have plenty of giveaways for fans in attendance, including ticket packages from the Jets, Knicks, Rangers, and Islanders, plus special guest appearances by Imani Toomer and Rick DPH, who's going to sit on my lap during the show. Well, that's great. And more. So mark your advent calendars and get ready Peter. to spread some cheer at the Michael K. Show Holiday Party. It's Friday, December 8th at your mother's house in Garden City Park, Long Island. Brought to you by the New York Islanders, Jake's 58 Casino Hotel, Yingling Traditional Lager, and Flight by Yingling, the perfect beers for the holiday season. Security Dodge, visit securitydodge.com and some come get some selection and benefiting the Garden of Dreams Foundation. Let's go to Tom in Syracuse. Tom. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. You got it. Um, so I just got a would you. Um, so this is, if you could choose the day you were going to die, and just the day, would you rather pick a day that you like or a day that you don't like? Hmm. What, what do you mean? What do you mean, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, well, Saturday? Could, I mean, it could be something like that. Or, or maybe like, or like, you know, maybe Don likes Arbor Day, and it's just like, you know what, I want to go on Arbor Day. Or it's like, you know, I hate Arbor Day, and I want to be like, as long as I hate this day, why Might not as well hate die it even it. more? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my answer to that is I, I, I always, I've, I've always thought, wouldn't it be awful to die in the middle of a baseball season and not know how it turned out? It's not going to matter. You're dead. But I won't know how it turned out. You won't no. care because you're yeah. dead. Yeah, and unless the Yankees won, it wouldn't have affected your now, life. If at you all. believe in God in heaven, then I'm sure God will tell you. Yeah, but the problem and is, if you I, mean, don't, I don't know if you talked to God recently. He can't figure out the Apple plus Don. He, he doesn't know whether it's but on somebody Prime. somebody in heaven will tell him. His... Michael's dad will tell him. Right. But if you believe in complete darkness and then that's it, it won't matter because you won't be there. I right. understand so way, that you good. won't be there, but then I don't. I want to know how the, the season like turns there, out because there's nothing to want to know. I just said if you're in heaven, the, somebody will tell you. If it's complete darkness, there's not anything. I, to no, know no, no, I'm not saying that once I die, it's going to matter to me. But I would like to know how it turned out. Like on his way out the door, Don, his, his last thought would not be of his wife and children. He'd be going, but did the Brewers win? 
All right. Well, his last thought depends on how you go, too, because the last my thought might be, <laughs> there's a bus. Right. Or, oh, my God, that foul ball's coming off of fat. Yeah. Or what's that uh, tremendous pain in my chest? Oh, my God. I'm, well, how do you die, Peter? <laughs> Are we all going to go in our sleep. sleep? I hope so. That'd be great. And if you're sleeping, you're not going to be thinking about it. Die. You're going to be dreaming about it. You'll probably be upset about the dream that got interrupted. Peter, I, I, I don't want to kill. <laughs> Don, when I'm getting ready for game, what do you mean? I have to be prepared. I have my lot of cards, the latest team stats. And Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. show everybody we talked about tom brady and tom brady uh, gave me a little bit of an inkling i don't know how much of it don and peter heard but if he's going to be this honest and this forthright he might be good in the booth might be we'll see calling a game is a completely different thing than giving a hot take but he was on stephen a smith's show and um this is what he said uh about today's nfl there's a lot of mediocrity in today's NFL. I don't see the excellence that I saw in the past. Why not? And ho Why not? I think the coaching isn't as, as good as it was. I don't think the development of young players is as good as it was. The rules have allowed a lot of bad habits to get into the actual performance of the game. So I just think the product, in my opinion, is less than what it's been. I think I look at a lot of players like Ray Lewis and Rodney Harrison and Ronnie Lott and guys that impacted the game in, in a certain way. And every hit they would have made would have been a penalty. Mm. Your coach is completely complaining about their own player being tackled and not necessarily why don't they talk to their player about how to protect himself we used to work on the fundamentals of those things all the time now they're trying to be regulated all the time offensive players need to protect themselves it's not up to a defensive player to protect the offensive player a defensive player needs to protect himself i didn't throw the ball to certain areas because i was afraid players were going to get knocked out mm -hmm. that's the reality wow. i didn't throw it to the middle when i played ray lewis because you knock him out of the game and i couldn't afford to lose a good player so interesting points, but, you know, these are not points that Tom made when he, you know, Peter just brought it up earlier. He was protected as if he was a rare, you know, a China doll. So I'm not quite sure that it has all that much oomph because he benefited from these rules. And those rules were put in place so that older quarterbacks and quarterbacks in general would not get hurt. But I mean, overall, I do agree with him. You can't touch anybody anymore in the NFL. But, yeah, I mean, does he win that Tampa Super Bowl without that? I mean, I don't think he gets uh, to that Tampa football Super Bowl without it. Now, listen, it may be now that would really show me something if he goes, hey, I took advantage of it. You know, I'd like to hear that part because, Don, well, we can't pretend as if he's some old timey player now right. talking about yesteryear. This was 30 seconds ago in the league that he dominated. Right. And also he had the luxury being on a great team of throwing the ball away, not putting his wide receiver in peril. And comparing it to a young kid trying to get a completion, trying to get a first down, trying to save his job, trying to save his season, you know, it's a little bit different. I mean, can, you know, Zach Wilson, when he was playing, did he have the luxury of, of not putting Garrett Wilson in peril or was he just trying to get the damn first down? so they can move the chains and maybe win a football game to save his job? So it's kind of apples and oranges. I think the difference is, is the two-a-days. You know, now we're down to three preseason games. Um, training camps are a picnic compared to what they were when Tom first started in the league 20 years ago, right? And even colleges, they're not going through the rigors of training that they did years ago. And the, the game is pretty much, you know, the, the same, but they, they don't go through the same training. So I think they're getting hurt more. I, I think the game is, is, is a little bit. And when I say softer, I'm not meaning that like a, a weakness. It's just that I don't think these guys are trained the way they yeah, should be to now play 17 games in an 18-week schedule. Is, and, he, and here's the thing. You have to be mindful when you have this conversation, all of us, about who we're really blaming here. Because it's very easy to get caught up having a conversation. I heard Barton Hahn talking about this earlier. The lack of practice. But you have to remember where the lack of practice is coming from. It's all essentially stemming from the greed of the NFL to keep adding to this schedule. 
And it's so, also negotiated by the Players Association. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. So it's not fair to put this on the individual players no. when the fact is they're going to be, before we know it, playing 18, 19 Guys. football games a year, and we're going to be complaining about how bad True. the practice is. But the fact is the reason but, the practice is bad is because they're insisting they play tons of games. But it's also, and, I, and I'm not saying it should change because we should care about the health and safety and the well-being of these players, but it's not the game we grew up with because for, for a reason. If you're trying to make football less dangerous and you're trying to keep the players healthy, let's be honest, you are taking some of the fundamentals out of the game, some of what we grew up entertained by out of the game, and now it's just become an offensive monster. He brought up Ray Lewis, and I was thinking while he was saying that. I know Ray Lewis was special, Lawrence Taylor was special, but outside of Parsons, like, who's the special defenders anymore? It's an offensive league. They're the ones that I do mean, the commercials. They're the ones that everybody talks about. They get the interviews before and after the game. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Yes. Hey, everyone. Welcome to ENN. On TV. Ray Rowe. Not just any ENN. It's the ENN before Thanksgiving break. Yay! You me? Wow. Brought to you tonight by Security Dodge. See Michelle Scalisian. Come get some. I'd like to start off by saying good evening to Michael K. Dan Fortenbaugh, Dan Orlovsky. We'll Sweet. Make our Clean day. I'd like to say good evening to Michael. And he's off that tree. <laughs> I learned something I'd else like today. To say, I'd like to say good evening to Don. I've been routinely feeling. going to bed before 11. And I'd like to say good evening to myself. He's high. <laughs> He's high. That's very usable. Very usable. All right. Well, first of all, b before we get into this Jim Irsay story, which is... Is it Irsay or Irsay? Irsay. We all, er. It's Irsay. We don't go ear? No. He's not, it's, not like, no. it's not like Spanish to go. To go. If you use ear, yeah. he's going to be tweeting about you. It's Jim Irsay. Um... Uh, real quick, there's also been an argument going on this last week or two on social media. I'm curious your guys' opinion about whether or not it's appropriate to recline in a coach seat on a plane. Michael? Um, I think it's appropriate, and it's not appropriate to go back blindly. You got to look. I, oh, I, you okay. got to look, and also I think you should go back slowly. And slowly. I, I agree. I never look, but I do go slow. You, you know what? That's in all. See, this is what makes our show special. <laughs> So much conversation about whether you should or shouldn't do it. These, like, people want a hard and fast rule. No nuance. But, but, but you guys both just mentioned something that's so important to the conversation. Doing it slowly is such a difference than when someone just jams their seat back in. Also, lap. how could somebody say you, you shouldn't be allowed to? I mean, the seat goes back. You paid a lot of money for it. Sorry. Right, and then, and then yours goes back also, yeah. so you can go back a bit also. Mm -hmm. I, I don't fully get it. But any, let's get to the story of the day. Jim Ursay was interviewed for HBO Real Sports. Uh, let's hear what he had to say. Jim. I am prejudiced against because I'm a rich white billionaire. If I'm just the average guy down the block, they're not pulling me in. Of course that. Do you know what it's going to sound like if people hear you say they're prejudiced against a rich white billionaire? I don't billionaire? care what it sounds like. It's the truth. I can give a damn what people think how anything sounds or sounds like. The truth is the truth. Now, he's, of, of course, referring to back, uh, what was that, 2016, something 2014. like that? 2014. 2014? Mm -hmm. No, it's been that long. When he was pulled over and caught with uh, uh, all kinds of prescription drugs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, after this story came out, as you can imagine, many people spoke about it. It was even uh, spoke about, uh, spoken about on First Take, included by uh, Stephen A. Smith and our own Kimberly Martin as well. Ursay responded to the First Take episode, apparently. On Twitter, a couple hours ago, he said, first take, you're going to get your ass sued because there was no alcohol, no illegal drugs. And $29,000 is low for me to be carrying in 2014. I give away two to $10,000 to the homeless and, and that need it on the street all the time and pass it on, making the world better. Heart emoji. My grandparents came across Ellis Island 
with just a shirt on their back, penniless, and escaping Jewish concentration camps. I grew up in a horrible home where both my brother and sister died in a car crash in 1971. Tear emoji. I worked for my living slash bought 30% of the cults. Bank loan. Football emoji. And on first take, the woman that preceded Stephen A. How dare you pretend to know me? I don't know your name, and I don't care to. Red face angry emoji. If my black mother Dorothy was still alive, you'd be in hot... You'd be in some big hot water. You are mean and ugly. Upside down smiling emoji. You are a nothing burger. Straight face emoji. This is an owner of an NFL team. For now. Remember, one who people already thought was potentially on the edge. I mean, how, how do you... Where do you even start, well, Mike? Let's start. Where do you start? You start from the beginning. You, 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 you got to start with the comment on Real Sports right. that during an interview... He thought it was a good idea to say out loud that he's discriminated against for being a rich, white now, billionaire. Now, is it possible that a, a, a police officer could know who he is and figure, I can make a name for myself by bringing him in? I, I guess it's possible. But the other 99 times it happens... In all likelihood, they're going to know who you are and say, all right, go, go about your business. Right? All right so, uh, honestly, does he, really, does he really think that could stick? Well, but remember, he didn't even say. It's even worse than that, though, Don. Because he didn't even say. It, the way he put the sentence together is so dumb. If he had said, hey, I'm the owner of the team and there are people in this city who have it out for me. By the way, it may not be true, but he completely gets away with saying it with no conversation. Like, he could make right. the argument, as the owner of the cults, I got a lot of enemies, and the police had it out for me. You might not agree with it, people might not believe it, but he could say it. The idea of being discriminated against for being uber-rich, white, and powerful uh, is, you sound ridiculous so, out of the well, gate. Because, and, and Michael, and to your point about being concerned about this guy and thinking he needs a mental health eval, the, he doubled down on it. She gave him a chance to say, right. hey, you know how this sounds. Yeah. I, I know how it sounds. I mean, he sounded unhinged. Well, no. I mean, I, I don't even take what he said on HBO. I mean, okay, the, if, that's, if that's how his mind processed that day, then that's how it processed that day, whether we think it's legitimate or not. So they attack all these sorts of things on first take. That's what first take's about. But the comments that he made, they, they come off as unhinged. No, no he Completely is. Completely unhinged. I mean, if, if I'm Roger Goodell, I don't even know what to do with this because I, I always laugh and people go, the, the commissioner should make himself a team. He works for him. Goodell works for Ursay. You know what you have to worry about? You have to worry about Kraft. And you have to worry about Jones saying, okay, he has to go now. He's embarrassing the league. But Roger Goodell doesn't have the power to tell him to, to sell. But, I mean, he's got to talk to him. He's, what are you going to put? If you want to sue them, sue them. But for Kimberly Martin... Whether you, the, it matters or not, to there's a beautiful woman for him to say you're ugly. I mean, that's unhinged in itself. No, he's he, he's. Can, a I, lot can I just on. say? I, I would just like to say, I never heard Jim Ursay's family being of any Jewish descent. He does not give me Jewish guy vibes. His father is of Jewish descent, but I would just like to say, Jewish Americans are going through a lot at this time. Jim, we don't need this. We are not taking you on right now. We've never claimed you previously, and I speak on behalf of the Jewish delegation. We do not claim Jim Do you Ursay. have that kind of power? I didn't even yeah, realize trust that. me. Yeah, I reached out to several people a right. little while ago. Howard Stern, um, Paul Simon, um, uh, Larry David. We all speak. We don't want you, Ursay. You, we, you, you, I'm sorry. You're, you're not part of the delegation. So please leave that part of your story out. Um, and then, yeah, everything is just... And I don't understand. I looked it up, by the way. Who's his black mother, Dorothy? Yeah, I don't know. Now... Uh, wait, wait, you sent me what tweet, Anthony? I sent you a tweet of uh, a picture. Uh, Ray Santiago actually found it um, of him showing a picture of his nana, Dorothy. Nana, his nana is different Dor than his mother. Because his, his mother, his mother is Polish. So there's a woman, his quote, black mother, Dorothy, was he related to I, this I person? I guess it, maybe it was his nanny. And well, he that's considered not, her his, you know, his black well, mother. He might have called them his I, black mother. I got mother. news for you. That doesn't play well either, Jim. No, it doesn't. And furthermore, why do you, why would you need to call on your quote black mother Dorothy to defend you against the scary black woman Kimberly Martin? 
The whole thing is based on racism uh, and craziness. Well, well, here's another tweet. Oh, boy. Tell that bald little creep on the Michael K show I'm coming <laughs> after him. <laughs> Questioning what? my Jewishness? Let's see. Wow. Yeah. Now, I was giving him, like, the, that would be, like, the low-end benefit of the doubt of that maybe he was singled out because of his celebrity. But in all likelihood, it, it sounds to me like he, he's one of those people that now feel like his, his position is now the, the minority and now that, the, <laughs> that they're being off-put. Yeah, that, that, that's not going to hit well with the rest of the nation, man. It's not going to hit well with Sorry, anybody. But, but now, now you've got to try to compare yourself to somebody being pulled over, a minority being pulled over. Uh, come on, man, really? That's really rough. But he, and again, and, and what's important to point out here in terms of how this affects, you know, the overall business besides just looking foolish. If you're one of the players on that team, how do you play for this guy mm -hmm. who starts saying things like this? Who starts talking about uh, being discriminated against because he's a white billionaire or his, quote, black mother Dorothy and, it, and calling Kimberly Martin ugly? How do you, you want to play it, it for really, this guy? It really depends on how they feel about him to begin with. I don't know what his relationship is with the players, but what if it's very good? Are you willing to just let it slide? Or if your relationship is, well, we know this guy's probably bigoted, but he hasn't done anything publicly to say anything, so we'll live with it. And now he does. Well, then you've got a problem on your hands, don't you? And what is the story about the 2014 arrest? He was intoxicated, or at least high or something. But do we have the facts on that? Was, is he telling the truth that he, he didn't have possession of drugs? No, no, he, no, no. He said it wasn't illegal drugs, and he's defending the amount of money that he had in his pocket. Because obviously, you're not allowed to drive around with thirty-eight thousand dollars in your pocket. Why? If you get, well, if you get pulled over with thirty-eight thousand, you, you're allowed to, but it, it ends up looking and appearing criminal. You can't drive around with drugs and thirty-eight thousand in your pocket. But he did go in, I think, into a rehab right after that, so he had his problems. Okay, so you want to make sure you get the facts right there. But still, he got arrested. It just seems very strange to take that tact. And then, as you said, Peter, to be given the door to get out of it and double down, he really does feel that way. She says, you know how that sounds? And he could have just been like, you know what? You're right. Let I mean, me clarify does he really? That. He really believes that the reason he was singled out, because he's a white billionaire. <laughs> Well, what else am I supposed to believe, Peter? He doubled down. I mean, these are the words he said. The words he, could, he, said. he could even have said, well, let me, let me put it this way or let me try to re you know, whatever. Because I guess, Peter, you know, getting back to our conversation about how it was, it was handled with the, the Carissa Thompson situation is that if he had taken it back, we probably don't even find out about this. Oh, speaking of Carissa Thompson, she just tweeted. <laughs> she just tweeted, uh, Jim Ursay has sold the Indianapolis Colts. Wow. No. That was you fast, sure that's but, true? Uh, oh, wait, sorry. I apologize. That was actually not the real Carissa Thompson that no, misspelled. No, but but in, in all seriousness, do you think that HBO, if he had said, you know what, maybe let me let me amend that. I, I probably shouldn't have said that. That it ends up on the editing room floor and we don't find out about it. Because that would probably be the fair thing to do. You gave him a chance to walk out of it. So I'm assuming oh, yeah, yeah. HBO would then not, you would not have found out about this. No, I mean, if, if he had corrected it, my guess is she still would have, if, if it gets corrected, they still include it, but they include the correction. You know what I mean? Okay. Then, yeah, that's, that, 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 listen, both are fair. He said it, but with it being taped and giving him the out, if he had just completely disowned it and said, you know what, after thinking about that, that does sound awful. Let's, let's start again. Do they still air it? And people have the nerve to rip New York owners. <laughs> I mean, he's he's not what you want. But it's, it's another it's one of those. It was it was his um you know it was his dad's team. Oh yeah, took it you from know, Baltimore. So although, in the according, of the night. although according to him, he worked very hard and, and got a loan and paid for thirty percent or something. All right. So Greek tells me Ursay pleaded guilty to operating a vehicle while intoxicated, a misdemeanor. Asked why he pleaded guilty uh, if he had been profiled. Ursay said he just wanted to get over with. Okay, pal. Mm. Uh huh. And he claims that when he was asked to take a field sobriety test and looked unsteady walking, it was because he just had hip surgery. I mean, there's a lot going on. So he's there. not even claiming to have done anything wrong in right. 2014. 
No, he's, he's good, Don. It's all over. It's crazy that Snyder got out of there actually so, faster than Ursa. So I, I guess being a white billionaire helped him into just saying, all right, listen, I, I just can't be bothered with this. I'll just accept the misdemeanor and pay the fine. I, I, like, well, there's a lot of people that can't afford to do that, Jim. Now, Don, he has a lot to deal with, and if you don't watch out, He'll get his Jewish father and his black mother to come fight you. Let's hear from Tommy DeVito. Wait, wait, That's wait, right. wait. Uh -oh. Another tweet from him. Is this real yeah, or fake? Yeah, it's from Ursay. Tell Here that Santa Claus-looking creep to shut up. He doesn't know me, never will. He'll be getting a lawsuit soon. And now I got to jump in. <laughs> I got to defend my guy. <laughs> Dapper Don LaGreca. He's a good-looking guy, unlike that unhinged Ursay. <laughs> Jim unhinged Ursay. He once tried to get into Mar-a-Lago. I said, no, no, no interest. <laughs> Take a walk. Unhinged Ursay. Not my guy, not Dapper Don, a Jersey guy, a regular guy like me. All right, let's hear from Tommy DeVito on his first start. As it's going to be a lot of fun. Imagine it's going to be like the last two games, but a little more of my friends and family there. That's really First start at home. It. Uh, it's a little tougher to play in a way of atmosphere, so to be home, I'll be comfortable. It'll be a lot of fun. How many people will you have here? I'm not sure, honestly. A lot. I, I assume a lot, but I'm not sure exactly. And I wish I could give you a number. I know the last preseason game, the Jets game, I probably had 200 something, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure how many will be here. So. so he was also asked about his TD celebration, which I'm sure you guys, you saw it, right, yes. Don? Yep. How, how do you describe that? Kind of like uh, Python, something yeah. like that, right, Don? Yeah. He, th he throws up his fingers in the air like, yeah, like, uh, e. like hey, hey, so what, a yeah. what a delicious brazil, oh. you know? <laughs> brazil. <laughs> Let me get the gabagoo. You know what I mean? Uh, here's DeVito <laughs> talking about his TD celebration. That was up to Phil. Phil Buzz and the AT, he mentioned it to me a couple weeks ago. And I'm like, all right, I'll roll with it one of these days. And he's like, this is the week. I'm like, all right, I did it. And then kind of took off from there. What do you think about it? Tell you to that? Oh, for sure. That's the whole background of it. But, Explain uh, it. What does it mean to you? It means to me. I don't know. I kind of thought it was just, you know, the old Italians, when they talk, they start doing this. That was just kind of a little credit <laughs> to this guy yeah, over there. A little bit. Come on. Let me, look at this guy, Tommy. Forget over about here. it. We're playing football over here. <laughs> now, what's going to happen? You guys don't know this. I looked into a crystal ball. They're going to go on a run, and they're going to make the playoffs. Right. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, gonna... it's going to be derailed because Tommy DeVito is going to have a boat trip outside Seaside Heights. Yeah. No, I, you know, they're going to show up. The, 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 by the way, this is this is just completely leaning into ridiculous stereotypes. <laughs> They, before the big playoff game, Don, everyone's been waiting for Tommy DeVito's big start. He's been completely embraced. And when he shows up for practice on Monday, the week before the playoff game, every limb broken. Just shows up in a wheelchair every, because they didn't cover the spread the week before. Oh, see, and now, then you going, now you took it a little too far. Yeah, you got a little out of line yourself. <laughs> sorry. Funny like a clown. I'm sorry. What do I look like? Clown? You sorry. What's going to happen uh, is I couldn't get to the game because the IROC doesn't have the snow tires. Yeah. So I'm spinning and spinning and spinning. <laughs> I want him to wear, like, pleated pants when he's playing the game. Uh, here's Tommy DeVito again. Who cooks Thanksgiving dinner at the DeVito house? My mom. My mom, one of my cousins, Daniel, he comes over. He's, he does the turkey and the ham and gets on the smoker and does all that. My dad does not cook. I've never seen my dad cook once since I've been alive. He won't make a peanut butter and jelly. My mom handles everything. Except for your cousin, Daniel. Tommy, it's dinner time. <laughs> Giraffe's downstairs. I've... Come on, now we're waiting. I got bad news, everyone, except for Michael. We're not going to do an NFL oh, announcer you know it's, it's, You know what? It's a special Wednesday. We didn't do a widget today. I know. It was a big Ursa day. You know, there's games. There's announcers. There's channels. Hold on. Let me hear. Uh, can, I just, can I just get a Kevin Harlan, please? I'd just like a Kevin Harlan before we get out of here. That's, as long as I hear Kevin, I feel like I can move on. Nope. Uh, All right. I want to hear it. Fortunate. No. How about uh, okay. being able to play the piano with uh, by ear. The guy is drunk. There you go. Because as I say, Kevin Harlan's applies to so much about Thanksgiving. That'll do it for ENN. Brought to you by Security Dodge. Shop 24-7 at securitydodge.com. Go see Michelle Scalise. Grab a t-shirt and come get, get some. some. All right. We'll for be on Black tomorrow Friday at 3 o'clock. Um, fresh open. Some great interviews that we've had over the past couple of weeks. So tune in for that. Um, Obviously, Friday is, is the Jet game. Jets against the Dolphins at 3 o'clock. And we'll be back We're again with a full show on Monday. Coming up, sure. Nets coverage on Yes. 
and um, Ranger coverage right here on 98.7. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody. We love Happy you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. That's a wrap on the show for today. Coming up next, our coverage of the Hawks and Nets gets underway with the pregame show. For all of us here on the Michael K. Show, this is Chris Sheeran saying have a great night. Enjoy the game. Enjoy your Thanksgiving, your long weekend. We will see you Monday at 3 o'clock. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching, yes. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching, yes.